thank you everybody for being here. This is the annual Parsons Field Institute Symposium. It was um, in earlier days called the Update, and then we kind of merged this uh, the concepts of symposium and update uh, to bring you this. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, for some reason, I'm having trouble advancing the slides with us. Probably, whoa, probably because I've got three screens. Okay. So, welcome. Um, for those of you who are new, um, I know many of us are uh, have been with the Field Institute for a while, but for those of you who are new, the Parsons Field Institute is the research arm of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. So you can think of it as kind of a branch or a department. Um, it's the science in, in the Conservancy mission. It began in about 2010 when we got a grant from the um, Pulliam Foundation to do flora and fauna studies and grew from there. Uh, it includes the citizen science program, conservancy staff, and many, many partners, um, some of whom you're going to hear from today, um, but there are way too many to count. So we'll, we'll do our best to highlight the ones that have been very active this year. Uh, studies in the preserve um, provide, and the Sonora does it, provide information for sustainable management, science, and education. And those are three things you're going to hear, hear about quite a bit today as well. The purpose of this annual symposium is to keep people updated and connected. Uh, so, you know, we, we do a lot during the year and it's really good at the end of the year to turn around and be able to say, wow, look at what we did. Uh, to highlight our partners and, um, and some of our, you know, successes and accomplishments and then to communicate the road ahead. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please mute yourself during the presentations, and that includes a presenter. Um, that, that just ensures that we don't have background noise. Uh, each presentation will be followed by questions. So um, we, we uh, prefer people to use the chat uh, button for the questions. And below, um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see uh, we've got a red box around that chat button. So that's how you can open that up and put your questions or comments in the chat. Um, right over here uh, in the other red square is the mute button. Um, stick around for a prize after the break. We will have a, a short break in the middle and, um, and a, a fun prize for the people who, uh, who stick around. We'll put your name in a raffle. And just to let you know, all of the presentations are gonna be recorded and made available via YouTube link afterwards. So we'll have these um, on our YouTube channel. We'll be sending them out in um, subsequent communications. And um, we're also going to be breaking them apart into smaller sections and labeling them. So um, for the teachers on here or, um, or other partners who want to use these for classes or demonstrations, you'll be able to easily find the section that you're interested in and, and forward that. So that's been a big help. Uh, as we go through the presentations for our presenters, you will hear a chime. Um, they are timed, and I know that um, you all have those times, but we all need a little reminder every once in a while. So when you hear the chime, that means that we're getting close to um, the uh, question section of your presentation. So uh, today, this is our agenda. Um, we are doing things a little bit differently than we have in years past. Um, many of our updates have been sort of a, a, you know, an update on each and every project. And this past year, we wanted to do things a little bit differently. Um, we had a lot of questions um, about how our projects fit together, kind of what the overall goals are of all of our projects. How they, um, how they help reach management goals uh, and, you know, kind of what the overall purpose of, of the way that we do our work is. And so we really wanted to kind of use the opportunity to organize our thinking around those questions and communicate that. So you, what you're not going to see is an update on each and every project. All of our projects are vitally important to what we do. But we've picked out the ones that um, have, you know, some particular um, results this year or highlight, you know, these questions in a particular way. And we're going to highlight them this year. 
Other projects will be highlighted in subsequent years. Uh, so the way that we've organized this is into three parts. Um, part one is the science and adaptive management framework. And that's how we are gonna be communicating how we're, all of our projects hang together and work together to help for science and management of the preserve and, uh, and beyond. Um, after that, we're gonna have a 15 minute break, um, stick around for the door prize. And then in the second part, we're gonna ha we have some uh, partners who have agreed to join us and talk about the value of scientific collaboration. Um, as many of you know, we work inside the preserve, but our results are all applicable to areas outside the preserve. And um, we do a lot of work outside the preserve as well. Uh, scientific work is, um, you know, it needs to be shared uh, and with as many people as possible. And so our partnerships make that possible and you'll be hearing from them. And then in part three, uh, we have the next generation of conservationalists that you're gonna be hearing about our science and education. Uh, and you're gonna be hearing from our first group of high school students who are uh, the pioneers for our Living Lab program. And they're gonna share with you their journey uh, developing the Living Labs at Saguaro High School. And then after that, we'll have a brief looking forward into the year ahead. So another thing for you uh, who are new to the Conservancy in the Field Institute, um, we have a particular way that we do science at the Conservancy. It's applied science. Um, a lot of it's management driven, but uh, long-term monitoring is a big part of that too. And just to take you on a very brief journey, uh, this started with flora and fauna surveys um, back in 2010. And the big question that drove those were, you know, how do we manage the preserve if we don't know what's there? And those flora and fauna surveys gave us the first lists of plants and animals on the preserve um, so that we could figure out what we needed to do. And from that, we worked with the Science Advisory Committee and other partners to figure out um, how do we monitor this to figure out if it's changing? And that's where many of our long-term monitoring projects started. You wanna know what you have, and then you wanna know what it's doing. And then addressing the question of how do we use this to make decisions, we developed the ecological resource plan, which you'll be hearing about a little bit more. Um, other plans like the invasive species management plan, uh, we reached out and developed more partnerships that would help us um, you know, understand how to make decisions with the, or how to make recommendations with the, the uh, information that we had. And um, you're gonna be hearing about adaptive management and exper experiments and how that is part of this as well. The conservancy model for doing science through citizen science is a very unique one. Um, our volunteer programs at the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy are very unique in that they are self-run. Um, volunteers lead the projects, they recruit, and they uh, develop succession plans. So those are self-perpetuating. You know, when, when a volunteer uh, picks another uh, thing to work on, we're not left with a hole. So they, you know, this is something that keeps going. Um, and many of our steward volunteers stay for a really long time, which makes this possible. Um, we also work with experts both inside and outside of the conservancy is in terms of hiring um, staff with expertise and then working with partners. Uh, and our stewards do much, much more than just field work or data entry. They are uh, involved in every aspect of our scientific programs. Uh, you probably heard a lot about this in, you know, if you've joined um, Citizen Science 101, et cetera. But, you know, for those of you who, um, who are new to the Conservancy, um, this is something that we're, is very unique and we're very proud of it. The preserve is also a very unique space uh, within a unique space. The McDowell Sonoran Preserve takes up over 25% of the landmass of the city of Scottsdale. Uh, and as you can see in the map on the right is connected to a lot of open spaces, including the Tonto National Forest, McDowell Regional Park, 
uh, the Fountain Hills Preserve, but also um, several reservations that are very important open spaces as well and connected to a much larger network. In fact, it's a very important piece of connection in that larger puzzle. So to briefly go over some of our goals uh, that we had for this year and, um, and our accomplishments within those goals, uh, you probably saw these at the end of the, uh, the symposium last year. Um, these were some of the things that we were looking forward to doing, uh, streamlining projects through strategic review, communicate our work to scientific partners um, and the broader public, find areas of intersection between science and education, increase the number and opportunities for citizen science and increase opportunities for non-stewards, and then link with other citizen science groups. So just very briefly, some of the things that we've done along the way. Um, to streamline our projects through strategic review, we actually use that as the basis for um, our science and adaptive management framework that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we completed the first review of each of our 11 projects. And this was an in-depth review involving citizen scientists, staff and partners. We developed a framework for communicating how that those fit together. And we began work on our management goals um, to develop management goals uh, for each of our projects. We also outlined the possibilities for education within those. More to come on that. To communicate our work, um, we published several papers and you'll notice some citizen science names in those papers. Um, that's another thing that we're very proud of. Again, our volunteers are involved in every aspect of our work. Um, a couple other highlights are uh, staff member Mary joined the board of Southwest Vegetation Management Association, so that's exciting. We continued our work with the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance, and we presented at the Biennial Conference of Science and Management. Um, we also presented at the Southwest Vegetation Management Association Conference, too. That seems to have dropped off the screen. We've just done too much this year. Uh, we also wanted to communicate our work to the broader public and link to other citizen science groups. And some of the many things that we did along those lines were we developed science-based hikes and walks. These are free, open to the public. Um, some of them uh, focused on our wildlife camera project, biodiversity, iNaturalist birds and butterflies. We developed presentations for the general public and joined the Citizen Science Association, which is an international group. Uh, we developed our citizen scientists, uh, developed some posters for the uh, Citizen Science Conference. I'm going to flash these in front of you really quick. Um, you won't be able to read them all, but they will be up during the breaks if you want to take a longer look at them and you'll be seeing them again. So these are just some of the really beautiful posters that um, are going to be presented at the Citizen Science Association Conference next week. And uh, with NAU, we're continuing our work on the IUCN plant assessment. Um, and here's some early results from that. That's very exciting. Again, we'll be up during our break. Uh, we developed a, uh, a conceptual model for blending science and education through our spiraling curriculum. Uh, you're going to see this later in the second half. Claire Musser is going to present it. And this really demonstrates how our research uh, fits into our uh, educational offerings and how we build upon, you know, what the students learn year over year. And of course, our goals for our citizen science program were to increase the number and opportunities for citizen scientists. Um, we did this by creating more support roles and filling those assistant lead roles. We evaluated each project for opportunities for new citizen scientists. And we maintained a number of weekend projects, took opportunities to include students and developed an internship pipeline through SCC to involve more non-stewards. And with that, those are just a few of the highlights, the top level highlights uh, for the Parsons Field Institute. Again, welcome. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Jensen, who is our new Citizen Science Chair. Thank you very much, Melanie, for that introduction. I am the Citizen Science Chair. And our mission, of course, is to support the Parsons Field Institute in their research initiatives. So realistically, we spend most of our time 
helping to organize research projects, and then gathering and interpreting the resulting data. And I just want to give a shout out to the Parsons Field Institute staff. It's a delight working with them, Melanie, Mary, and Jesse. And they're really wonderful about collaborating and sharing their expertise, and they're always open to our suggestions and, and any concerns we might, we might have. In addition to that, of course, the Institute has a great number of wonderful partners that we also work with, and we very much appreciate those interactions. And we're going to hear from a number of those partners today later in the symposium. So we'll be looking forward to that as well. We'll start with a few statistics. During the past season, 238 citizen scientists contributed hours to the program. They represented about one third of all active stewards in the conservancy. And those 238 citizen scientists contributed 11,578 hours to the Conservancy and the citizen science program in particular. So as you know, the Conservancy encompasses 10 different steward-led, steward-staffed programs. And in comparison to those programs, the number of citizen scientists contributing in our program was above average. On the other hand, the total number of hours, those 11,000 plus hours, were exceeded only by one other program in the Conservancy, that being the patrol program. During the past season, we had certified citizen scientists to the number of 64. Those are people who have gone through the qualification process, capped off by an exam to evidence their proficiency. And so we're grateful for all of those citizen scientists who have become certified. Obviously, that's quite a high proportion of all of our citizen scientists. The statistic that I'm really enthused about is the 49 hours worked on average by each citizen scientist during the past season. That was tops for the conservancy. There was one other program that approached us. None of the other programs, frankly, were even close. And so I think the wonderful takeaways here are that we have a really dedicated core of citizen scientists. They're really unmatched in their productivity. And many of them have achieved a really relatively high level of proficiency. And I want to dwell on highlights for the few minutes that I'm talking to you. So those are some wonderful highlights. We'll start out with our five well-established long-term biodiversity projects. Obviously, it takes a lot of very consistent and detailed, careful work to gather the data as these projects go forward well into the future. Frankly, during the past few years, we've fallen behind in incorporating the data generated into the tools that allow us to review results and test hypotheses. So during the past season, Jesse Dwyer assembled a team of five citizen scientists and through their really diligent effort, they upgraded all of our databases and made certain that all the data was properly applied. So we appreciate that monumental undertaking. As far as the butterfly survey goes, uh, during the past season, they offered their first annual research forum and were also involved with guided hike and bike and offering the first public butterfly hike in the preserve. Of course, it's always really exciting when new species are identified in the preserve and that honor this past season went to the bird survey project. They identified two new species, the white-breasted nuthatch and the American red start. That brought the total number of birds observed in the preserve to 189. Another highlight was the energy in the phenology project. They added two species to their inventory of flora that they're monitoring. They put a great emphasis on new observers to the program and for the first time offered orientation classes and group field training sessions for those new observers. We'll move on to our two relatively recent biodiversity projects. The tortoise survey is a grant-funded three-year study 
that we hope and believe will be extended beyond that time. Each of 23 tortoises is located by telemetry and its GPS unit serviced every three weeks. And frankly, we'll never know how they managed to locate all those tortoises to begin with, but I've seen some wonderful photos of citizen science feet protruding from caves and citizen scientists wedging themselves into some really unbelievable crevices in the rocks. So this has been a monumental effort supported by the work of over 70 stewards who worked more than 2,400 hours during the past season. The wildlife camera project is really a resurrection of an earlier, more limited study in the North Preserve. The goal is to install 60 cameras uniformly dispersed throughout the entire preserve. And during the past season, almost all of the necessary survey work involving some really Interesting travel into remote and challenging terrain was, was almost all completed. Both of our degraded lands projects underwent significant ex expansions of their research work during the past season. And a highlight was entering into the Living Labs program with Scottsdale High Schools. And we're gonna hear a lot more about that initiative later on in this symposium. And finally, the Invasive Plants Project is a really complex project, research, surveying, eradicating, monitoring. The paper presenting the results of their buffalo grass research was just accepted for publication by the Biological Invasions Journal. Their eradication teams treated an amazing 100 acres plant by plant during the past season. And for that effort, they received the Southwest Vegetation Management Association's Weed Manager of the Year Award. And the city of Scottsdale, largely relying on input from the project, received a 192,000 grant from the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. And outside crews are funded by that grant. They're working in the preserve, collaborating with us. And lastly, I want to mention our administrative functions. We have a very active communications group, and they also oversee, in addition to newsletters and websites, et cetera, the important work of certifying citizen scientists. And during the past season, we had seven new certified citizen scientists, more than a 10% increase in, in the number of those folks. We recently undertook a very comprehensive leadership development review in the program. And one result was that for the first time, all of our major research projects are now staffed with a lead and an assistant lead or co-lead. And so that's really important to consistency and moving forward with those programs. The education function has always been around, but we just created a new staff position, a lead to handle that important work. And of course they coordinate a lot of educational offerings within the program, such as our orientation class, which was attended this past season by 73 stewards, over half of all new incoming stewards. And they're going to be focusing in the future on developing content as we collaborate with other programs in the conservancy. So there's been a lot going on. Um, our citizen scientists are really doing fantastic work. The, the Field Institute is doing fantastic work. It's a wonderful team. I'm just happy I could share some of these highlights with you. So Melanie, on those happy notes, I'm turning the gavel back to you. Thank you, Doug. Um, and we're we're so happy to have uh, all of our citizen science team. Um, they they just make this work uh, work, and we're really happy to have Doug as the new citizen science lead this year. And whoa, there it goes. Uh, thank you, Mary, for putting that up. So I'm gonna introduce the next part of our symposium. This is scientific research within an adaptive management framework. You're gonna hear from Jesse Dwyer on the adaptive management in an ever-changing world, uh, Dr. Helen Rowe on long-term monitoring, keeping the pulse of the preserve, uh, a graduate student who's been doing some amazing work for us, Arizona butterflies depend, depend on winter rains. He's been working with our data and has some interesting things to share. Uh, from Mary and Debbie on experimental research, focusing on our uh, on our um, restoration and invasive species. And then I'm gonna jump back in with management-driven projects 
um, highlighting our invasive species partnerships. So with that, I will turn it over to Jesse Dwyer, our biodiversity manager. Okay, so uh, like they mentioned, my name is Jesse Dwyer. I'm the biodiversity manager at the Conservancy, and today I'll be talking about adaptive management, uh, that framework, and how we incorporate that into the research we do in the Field Institute. And um, the overarching goal, uh, one of the overarching goals of the Field Institute is to maintain a healthy ecosystem into the future, you know, protect our natural resources and maintain biodiversity. However, there's many challenges that we face in trying to realize that goal. So for one, um, there's constant and continuous environmental change. So there's fluctuations seasonally, daily, yearly. Um, you might have a storm come through that you weren't expecting some sort of natural disaster. There's also human um, environmental change where landscape that used to be open space is now developed land. There's a new brand new road that goes through. There might be pollution, um, noise, sound and air pollution. So there's continual environmental change. Um, and some of this change happens at a rate that's difficult for flora and fauna to adapt to. And so we're seeing this unprecedented loss in, in biodiversity globally. Um, but it'd be one thing if the change was, you know, happened one time in one place in a vacuum and it was a really simple, easy fix. But of course, these systems are incredibly complex and there's multiple changes happening at once with varying levels of intensity and severity and frequency. So there's really, really complex systems with constant change and a lot of uncertainty. So even if you think you understand what's going on with an ecosystem, all of a sudden something surprising happens, like a new invasive species comes in. So there's, there's constant change and uncertainty in these systems. And so that's kind of a challenge in trying to maintain these ecosystems. Uh, in the same vein, though, there's uh, some things that are working in our favor as well. So as we uh, continue to advance um, our research, we have these scientific advancements. So our equipment gets better, our methods and our protocols get better. Um, so we more efficiently and effectively are able to manage and maintain uh, these ecosystems. And in the same vein, um, we're also collaborating and sharing our data um, with our regional and global partners. And there's been a, a big push to do that recently and we're continuing to do so. And all of that increased collaboration um, adds to the efficiency and improvements that go into our projects. But the really big question is, how do we even start? How do we decide um, how to make decisions in a world that is constantly changing and so complex and so uncertain? And one of those tools that we can use is a, a framework called adaptive management. It's a, a flexible decision-making process that can be adjusted in the face of uncertainties as outcomes of management actions, as well as other environmental changes become better understood. And so if we carefully monitor uh, those outcomes, it advances both scientific understanding and helps us adjust policies and protocols and practices when it comes to our management decisions. It's this iterative learning process. You learn by doing. So the more uh, you do and learn, you do better uh, kind of an idea. So you're simultaneously managing as well as learning about the natural resources at the same time. Um, and that concept uh, within a framework looks a little bit like this. This is the adaptive management framework. It's kind of a life cycle of a research project. So you start with assessing the problem that you have. So maybe you have a new invasive species or there might be some population declines or some degraded lands. You're starting with some sort of a problem. You design and implement a project in order to address that problem. You monitor the changes after you've implemented that uh, management decision or that, that study design. You evaluate uh, the results. And then based on those results, you might adjust uh, your um, you might adjust your practices, you might adjust your management of the land or the species group, or you might uh, find that you have a completely new problem that you need to address and you start the cycle over again. So it's just this continual okay. learning. Okay. Continual. Um, and um, I think, and I think sorry, I'm getting some feedback. All right, I think we're good. Okay, so I've taken this, um, diagram and I've adjusted it for the preserve. And it looks a little bit like this. Uh, Melanie showed it on the slide beforehand. So we start off with our flora and fauna surveys. We don't know how to maintain um, our ecosystem unless we know what's here, right? So we have our flora and fauna surveys, what's here, what's going on, assessing the situation. And then based on what we find, we can have uh, specific research uh, goals based on maybe there's a, a focal species, a sensitive species, 
uh, or a species group. It might be a, a group of bioindicators that are indicating the health of an ecosystem. It might be a targeted question. So what's the best way to restore land? And then we implement that study, monitor, and based on those results, we might do a couple different things. So we might um, have a different question like a, the diagram before. We might notice um, there's something we can do about it. So we have a management action. We monitor the results based on that, or we might just continue, continue and continue to monitor like our long-term monitoring projects until we have a result that goes, hey, we should implement this management decision and then we'll move to the management action. So it's this kind of continuous flow, uh, life cycle of these projects to constantly be improving um, our, our projects and improving uh, our management of these lands. So I'm going to talk about this concept with an example of a project we have in the preserve, and that would be the bat project. So for our bat project, uh, originally we, we found this old mine uh, where there was bats uh, roosting in it, and we wanted to know which bats are roosting in it. Are they using it as a maternity colony or just regular roost? Um, and particularly, is it a Townsend's figure bat roost, uh, which is a sensitive species uh, that resides in the preserve? And if so, it would be really important to protect this roost and also be very interesting because these bats are not only sensitive to human disturbance, but they're also roost specialists. So they have very particular requirements for the roost that they use. It's really rare to find one. So if we did find one, it would be really um, incredible opportunity to study uh, these bats. So we uh, conducted an experiment to first determine are there towns and bigger bats using this roost? And if so, how are they using it? What time of year? How active are they? Um, just all those kind of questions. What conditions are going on in this mine? And so to conduct this experimental study, we, we did some captures uh, annually from 2016 to 2019. In 2019, we confirmed uh, that the roost was being used by Townsend's Big Eared Bats and started our three-year experimental study of emergence counts using video recording. So up at the top right here is our harp track where we capture the bats coming out of the mine. And on the bottom right here is our video recording. You can see there's a bat flying out of the mine gate there. And that's to get an idea of the activity going on at the mine. We did that from 2019 to 2022. So what did we find? Well, uh, first thing, we confirmed that the old mine is an active maternity roost for towns and bigger batches. It's very exciting. Our last capture we did in 2022, we found 41 lactating or pregnant female towns and bigger bats. So it's a very, very active maternity roost. So it's something we definitely want to be monitoring and protecting. Um, then we also observed using the emergence counts uh, that bats were exiting the mine during most months, that they were least active in the winter and most active during March through May. And then preliminary data shows that bats emerge less when temperatures are super high or low. And we also found that there's a, a bit of a threshold you can see at this chart uh, at the top right here, where in the active seasons, bats are uh, around 20 or more bats uh, is what we consider bats being active. And that's in that March through May um, category. And then the question is, what do we do now that we have this baseline information about our bats? Well, we transitioned to more of a long-term monitoring project. So we really wanna monitor this population for any sort of declines. And we're also really interested to see if this colony is affected by white nose syndrome. It hasn't reached the area yet, but it's something we're looking out for. And so uh, what we'd like to do is proactively manage and monitor this uh, colony of sensitive, speed, of sensitive, sensitive bats. And to do so, we're gonna develop an adaptive management plan. And it looks a little something like this. So this adaptive management plan was developed uh, in collaboration with our partners. So uh, Field Institute staff and our research partner, Dr. Marianne Moore, as well as some Game and Fish folks as well. And Debbie Langenfeld, who you'll hear from later, uh, who's the lead of this project, uh, Citizen Science Lead. And the idea was to take all of the information we gathered with our experimental study, plus the scientific research, and have some sort of thresholds that will trigger management actions and also account for uncertainty, right? Uh, up at the top here, this is just a timeline throughout the year. And the idea is that we start in January, start our emergence counts, we're recording the bat activity. Then once we hit 20 bats, that's our threshold we've decided is our bat activity, we will conduct a capture to check for white nose syndrome. The reason we wanna do that is the closer you are to winter, the easier it is to find white nose syndrome on the bat species. So once we hit that 20, that's our trigger to go ahead and capture uh, bats and check for white nose syndrome. Then we'll continue those emergence counts through the active season, March through May, and then stop the counts when the bats are observed uh, less than 20 um, observations are observed two months in a row. And the reason we do that is we're accounting for the idea that just because March through May was the active season uh, for the bats the last three years doesn't mean it always will. If temperatures are changing, if conditions are changing, they might arrive earlier or later or leave earlier or later. And we wanna make sure we're accounting for that and not missing out on uh, important data. 
And then based on what happens uh, at these touch points along the way in this plan, um, we have uh, set aside uh, what we would do in, in the case of uh, WNS not being detected or WNS being detected, right? So if it's not detected, you know, we're not really worried about the, the disease on these bats. But if it is detected, we report it and we uh, launch our plan for white nose syndrome, which is you don't want to track that around to all the other bats, right? Um, so that's kind of the idea of this adaptive management plan is having really, really clear thresholds along the way and very clear measurements of when you want to act. And the reason this is so important um, is because when you are dealing with a sensitive species like this, right, um, you, can, you don't want to wait 10 years before you take action if the population is declining, right? So, you know, you want to be taking action and seeing if that action actually works to help that species. And based on that learning, and adapting along the way. So it's this way to really um, keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening, uh, especially with particularly with species that are sensitive or invasive species, things like that. Um, and so then just to round out this, uh, this frame of reference that we're doing with the BAT project and how that fits back into that graphic that we were talking about. We started out with that flora and fauna survey. The bats are there. It's a sensitive species. We're really concerned about it. So we have this experimental study where we're monitoring the population, seeing when it's active um, and conducting that research. And then based on the results, we now have these thresholds, um, these, this plan um, and what we can do about it if these bats uh, decline or we find white nose syndrome. And right now we're in that long-term monitoring section where we are just going to see what happens year to year, long-term monitoring based on those results. And unless we reach one of those thresholds, we'll just keep monitoring. And then if we reach a threshold of, oh, this population is declining or we've reached, uh, we detected white nose syndrome, then we implement a management action and monitor from there. So that's kind of the general life cycle uh, of the BAT project currently. And then you can apply that uh, concept to all the other research projects that we do uh, in the preserve, just with a few considerations. So having really clear and relevant thresholds, of course, what's good for bats might not be good for bobcats and so forth. So you have those really clear, relevant thresholds that you tweak as time goes on. You account for that uncertainty. So in the same way that we monitor well uh, on either side of the active season for the bats, you might do something similar for uh, a project that you're looking at to account for changes in the environment uh, year to year and unexpectedly. Um, and really kind of radically uh, accept this iterative learning process. So the more you know, the better you will do in the future and uh, leaving room for, for changes and improvements as we go on having those super measurable management actions. So because we're monitoring the population before we implement a manage management action and after, we can actually see if there are changes. So that's really important when managing an ecosystem. And of course, collaboration. So your, uh, your adaptive management projects are strengthened by the amount of partners that you have and information that you're sharing because everything that they're learning, they can share with you and you with them. And that also adds to that iterative learning process along the way. So we wanna make sure we're having uh, data that's comparable and shareable and that we're always implementing our data into regional databases and, and working with the people in the region and beyond. And this concept um, can go through all the different types of research that we're conducting currently in the preserve, our long-term monitoring, our experimental research, and our management-driven research, which you will hear about coming up here soon. Thanks, Jesse. This is a uh, time for uh, folks to ask any questions. We probably have time for uh, one to two questions in the the chat function. Jesse, what um, can you name a couple of benefits of uh, a healthy bat population? Yes, absolutely. So bats are very, very important for the ecosystem. A lot of the bats that we have in Arizona are insectivorous bats, so they're kind of like a a natural pest control. So they take down all the insects. Um, at night, so that's really important. Um, bats can also be pollinators. Um, so we have saguaros here, which is a plant that bats will pollinate. Um, and then they're also kind of just, um, yeah, they have the, the sorry. And there's actually, there's a bat um, called the pallid bat, which is one of my favorite bats. It eats scorpions. So if you're not a fan of scorpions, sorry to throw scorpions under the bus. Uh, they're really good at that. And they also are really bad at getting nectar out of uh, cacti because they are not uh, nectarivorous bats, but they're really messy. So they actually pollinate really well. So that's a, a fun desert bat uh, that's really good for the ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more. Is uh, white nose syndrome found in nearby states? 
Yes, it is. It is encroaching around us uh, as we speak. Um, and it's one of those things that we're really trying to be proactive about it because it's um, potentially a matter of time before it, it, it comes here. Now, uh, white nose syndrome is, is best uh, in cold and damp environments, um, but that doesn't mean it will always be that way. That doesn't mean there's not that um, cave conditions here. It also depends on uh, the bats uh, that get affected. Um, if they roost really close together, um, it might be more affected than bats that are more solitary. But one thing is that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're checking on the Townsend's bigger bat, we're not sure exactly how this bat is going to respond to white nose syndrome. But if it's in the area, that indicates it might be affecting other bat populations in the area as well. So since we have this roost, we want to monitor that. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have one last question. Um, I'll, I'll answer the other separately, but uh, can bats transmit uh, white nose syndrome to humans? Uh, no, it's a it's a bat to bat transformation. So the the disease will will be on our um, gear, and uh, the way that it was actually transferred was humans bringing European pathogens into the US. So the one thing we're really worried about is humans passing around the pathogen to the bats. But it's uh, it's a bat specific uh, pathogen, so it's not a human to bat disease. Okay, thank you. I think that concludes the questions. Next speaker up is Helen Rowe, Dr. Helen Rowe, our ecologist out of NAU, talking about long term monitoring in the preserve, keeping the pulse on the preserve. So I'll be talking about our biodiversity projects. And here we go. Let's see. So here's the um, diagram uh, Jesse just introduced. Uh, where we think about our um, management action. So I'll be talking starting about um, focal species and groups. So we have, uh, as you saw earlier, this is our list of long-term um, biodiversity monitoring projects. I'll be talking about uh, these ones and Melanie will be uh, touching on these ones a little bit later. I'm gonna, uh, for the, uh, my intro, I'm going to be giving a quick overview of some uh, analysis uh, that we've been working on just this year on arthropods and give a light overview of things and then introduce um, Bradley for the butterflies. Um, so we have um, been working with partners Derek Yui and Rich uh, Hostetter at NAU and also Stephen Earle at ASU, who's been our long-term uh, research partner at um, CAP LTER. Um, and we've also been working with the citizen science lead, Jerry Holden, and our current Joanne Goldberg. Um, so this is the setup of our arthropod studies. We've been um, conducting these and it's escaping me now how long, but we have um, several years of data um, dating back till 2014 maybe. And um, here's uh, each, the way it's set up is that we have interior sites and exterior sites um, in four places on the preserve boundary. We also have these two that were instituted for a couple of years as, um, as extra interior sites. I'm gonna delve straight into a few of the interesting findings uh, that, that we found. Uh, so here is, I'm gonna show you, um, these are different ways of looking at arthropod diversity. And so here's a plain number of species. This is a, a Shannon's index. So this talks about diversity. So that includes some other items. And this is uh, another diversity index that includes kind of evenness, how balanced are the species. But basically these are just different ways of lenses through which you can look at diversity. And the interesting thing to look at, let's see if we got pop-ups here, is that um, for several of the sites, we would see um, a difference between the interior, which is blue, and the edge site. So these are the locations um, in the preserve and blue is interior and orange is edge. So here's a difference in which the interior had more species than the edge site. Here's another one that had the same pattern at Tom's Thumb. 
another, again, a different way of looking at diversity, again, a gateway, and again, a gateway uh, for this other diversity index. So those are the main ones where interior was greater than exterior. But we also found a couple significant interactions um, in which we saw the opposite. For example, Lone Mountain with the Shannon's Diversity Index and also with the Evenness Index. So that was at Lone Mountain. We also found an interesting trend where our interior sites were also quite different from each other. So digging into that trend a little bit more, we had um, here is um, on the y-axis we have, I'm not going to go over all of these, but basically this is an overall abundance of our arthropods. This is um, a LPT, which is least practical taxonomic unit because Arthropods are very difficult to um, get down to species. And so sometimes we just get them down to genus or maybe above that. Um, so, and then we have ants and beetles and bristletails and fire ants and mites and spiders and springtails and true bugs. So all these groups um, of species. And the thing to note in this is that um, there was an interaction um, in abundance where in the spring, the interior sites had greater um, abundance than the edge sites, but then in the summer that switched. So we can see over here, this is, this is what's causing this, was ants and mites in which in the summer, they had these very big abundances of mites and ants and we, came to, we had enough um, resolution and identification that we were able to see that it was actually caused by fire ants coming in the summer. And so gen our, our summary take home was that there were differences between interior and edge differed among sites, but there was also, these were mediated by seasonality. Invasive ants were more prevalent at the urban edge and increased with temperature, so in the summer. Um, another thing I didn't show any graphs for was that precipitation favorably um, affected pretty much everything. All of the arthropods um, did better um, when there was um, more precipitation. So bringing this back to our adaptive management, um, when we think about, when we look at this, our arthropods, we see some of the results and the results are that, oh, look, we are having more fire ants um, in the urban edges. Um, we can start to, they we're just sort of getting through our analysis, but so we don't really have an idea of what that management action might be yet for fire ants, but that might be something that we can think about. We can, another thing we can do is think about maybe a targeted question about fire ants or the mites that might help us learn more about um, what we can do about this um, invasive um, fire ant. So now I'm gonna quickly change gears and give you a couple of quick updates on birds and plant phenology. So with birds this year, we've been working with a new database collaboration and Doug talked about um, the crew that we had moving some of our bird data into a new IBA database. We also developed a new butterfly database where we've been adding data to um, and these databases are gonna make it um, much better for us to be able to visualize and summarize our data. And so this next year, um, we'll be working on looking at our sensitive species um, and creating some summaries about those so we can learn more, um, analyze our data that way. The other thing is plant phenology. Uh, we did some preliminary analysis last year and we'll be bringing that um, forward uh, next year. That's gonna get some attention. Um, bats, uh, we've obviously been doing a lot of analysis on that, uh, that Jesse mentioned, so I won't mention that. So that brings us to butterflies. So as um, 
many of you must know, um, we're experiencing unprecedented uh, rates of extinction and loss of biodiversity. And so this sort of motivates uh, all of our biodiversity projects. Um, but thinking about it in terms of insects, um, insect declines have been almost double the, the losses as compared to vertebrate vertebrate species. There are many reasons for insects having such a high rates of decline, including nitrification, um, disruption um, caused by climate change, um, fire, storm intensities, global warming, droughts, pollution, urbanization, introduced species, uh, agricultural intensification, insecticides, deforestation. So um, insects are very sensitive to a lot of these stressors uh, and I think we, that's uh, why they think that these have been declining. Um, insects are um, obviously very important food webs. They're also important in nutrient cycling and pollination and um, many other um, vital aspects to them. And then, but they're um, out of insects. Butterflies are um, some of the most studied of the insects. Um, and this is because they're um, a little easier to study. They're a little more distinctive between species. They're attractive, people like them. Also, they come out during the day, which makes them easier to study. Um, but there's a, it's, um, they also have a scientific basis for being a good indicator of um, for insects. So, um, and by studying butterflies, we can also learn a lot about the rest of the insects. And so, because they experience comparable environmental pressures from habitat degradation, climate change, and land use change. They have short cycles, so they respond quickly to abiotic changes and they are reliant on plants as a source of nutrition. So um, also as plants go down, um, butterflies do as well. Um, they're ectothermic and so they're even more sensitive to climate change. Um, just a couple of years ago, this um, paper came out uh, about butterflies um, showing that fewer butterflies um, were being seen across the, the American West. Uh, and something interesting about this paper was that um, they used NABA data. Um, they actually used three different data sets, but one of them was NABA data. So as you may know, um, we contribute our data to NABA. NABA is the North American Butterfly Association. And so we um, share all of our data with them. And so um, it was uh, an interesting um, thing to find. And we, they found a 1.6% annual reduction across the U.S., um, Western U.S. And so, but we got to thinking about this and we've been, we were sort of ready to be starting to analyze um, our butterfly surveys. Um, and and um, Ron Rutowski and I did, did start some preliminary analyses. Um, but we found that uh, we were interested in finding out um, more of a context because there's a lot of variation. Um, we needed sort of a bigger um, study um, to look at this. So um, also compared to the um, Forrester paper that I just showed, Arizona has distinct bimodal precipitation patterns with the monsoon and the winter rains, which is different from the rest of the West. Um, and then also precipitation had increased um, since the data sets that um, that other paper used. They, they cut theirs off at 2018. And after that, we, we got some better rain. So we were wondering um, if we just focus on Arizona, will we still, still see the same level of declines? And we wanted to know also how climate factors specifically were affecting butterfly abundance and ridge tops. And so this is part of our monitoring 
We were trying to take the results and um, analyze them to try to figure out our next steps. So let's see. So I want to um, acknowledge uh, Ron Ratelski, who has been our um, butterfly partner, uh, research partner for um, the butterfly surveys. He's also the Navajo Central Arizona Butterfly Associ Association president, and of course, an emeritus um, from AS emeritus professor um, at ASU, and Gina Clark, who is our current um, citizen science lead. Um, for doing her work and helping um, keep these going. Um, and I reached out to some collaborators um, on this regional project to help, um, help with the analysis. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Bradley Johnson, who will be um, presenting uh, the analysis. Um, he just uh, graduated last week um, with his master's degree from ASU, from this school. And he works under, he was working under um, Dr. Jennifer Broach, um, at, also at Arizona State University, professor there. And um, Katie Prudick, who um, is, was actually on that Forrester paper I showed before about the declining butterfly species. And she's at the University of Arizona. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Rowe. Um, I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about the methods and results of our research um, titled Arizona Butterflies Depend on Winter Rains. To begin, I'm just going to do a basic introduction to the methods we used and the models that we created. So for variable creation and selection, our main goal was to identify what effects the climate has on butterfly populations in Arizona. Some additional information about the data with some sites in the some sites in the data set, including the preserve, sample multiple times a year. So to handle this, we created um, two groups. One we titled spring, which is any samplings from March 1st to June 1st, and the second group being fall, which is any samplings from July 15th to October 31st. Once we created these two groups, we had to create potential variables to analyze the data. Some of these uh, are examples are monsoon season precipitation winter season precipitation, and previous 30, 90, 365 days above the 30 degrees Celsius. Smaller examples would be minimum temperature of the previous X amount of days, also max and mean. Once we created all the potential variables, we analyzed them and it ended up going with these seven variables. So the ones we selected were the sites themselves, year, so that as the study goes on, the minimum temperature in the previous 30 days, the maximum temperature in the previous 30 days, monsoon precipitation, winter precipitation, and party hours. So now that we have a little background about the models, um, let's just do a little comparison visually, so that way it's just a little easier for everyone to understand. Here's the site map showing the 13 different sample sites, just so you can get a little visualization of the diverse ecosystems in the data set. So right here in the middle, this uh, octagon shape right here, this is the preserve. The octagon shape indicates that they sampled in the fall and spring. Where over here you have Sycamore Creek and uh, Boyce Thompson are triangles, so they're fall only. And then up in the Grand Canyon area, there's some boxes that are only spring. Just to give a little background about the sites. So now that we've seen the sites, we're just gonna, I just wanna move there. Um, talk a little bit about the overall precipitation throughout all the sites. On the x-axis, we have the year, and then on the y-axis, we have the precipitation total average for each site. So we have a 40-year time period from 1981 to 2021, and you can see uh, right here, the blue line indicates the annual precipitation, the green with the winter, and the salmon color with the monsoon. The gray area around the lines is a 95% confidence interval. That means that we're 95% confident that this best fit line actually resides in this area. Um, you can see that the monsoon precipitation doesn't necessarily change too much throughout the years. However, you see the winter with a decline causing the annual decline 
And in, in these years, you can see some high points still here. As Dr. Rowe mentioned, we, in recent years, we've had some more rain. Now we're gonna talk about overall party hours. So party hours is the time spent survey that the volunteers spend surveying in the field. We once again on the x-axis we have the 40 year time period, and on the y-axis we have the party hours. As you can see, the they are declining as well throughout the 40 time 40 year time period, and the confidence interval on the fall is much smaller than the spring. This is because in the fall we have 183 sampling events, whereas in the spring there's only 17. So we're less we're less confident about all of the results in the spring just because the data set size. Hey, uh, Bradley, before yeah. you go on too far into party hours, do you want to um, just uh, tell folks what those mean? Yeah, so that's the amount of time volunteers spend um, surveying on each sampling event. Sorry, I thought I mentioned that. Okay, so now that we've looked at the overall party hours, we're going to break it down by site. So here are the sites that we had. As you can see, the preserve is the second one. And on the y-axis, we have the party hours, which is individual or independent to each site. Um, these are box and whisker plots. So the top part of the box and whisker plot indicates it's 75%. The, this little line here is the mean and the bottom is 25%. And then the top of the whisker is 100 and the bottom is zero. Any dots would be outliers for this sampling set. As you can see, the preserve is has a very small box and like no whisker, which indicates that um, they're very particular with their party hours. So they probably are around 15, 16 hours every time they go out. Whereas you have sites like Patagonia that can vary anywhere from 55 to 70 party hours. So when looking at the spring, you'll notice that the preserve doesn't even have a box. And this is because partially because of the small sample size. There's only five in the spring. So it's just started recently. And with the Grand Canyon sites, there's only one sampling for each of them. So they therefore can't create a, a plot off that there's only one sampling. And then you have Sabino Canyon, which varies anywhere from 45 to 58 ish. Moving on from party hours, we have abundance. So once again, on the x axis, we have each individual site. And then on the the y-axis, we have the abundance. So this is the total number of butterflies that are cited in each sampling event. So what you might notice that the, these follow a very similar pattern to the party hours. So the preserve itself is in the low to mid range and party hours. So it also stays in that way in the abundance, whereas sites like Patagonia that had a lot of party hours also have a high abundance. The same uh, trend can be noticed in the spring. The preserve itself had lower party hours than Sabino, and it also has a lot lower abundance. So now that we've looked at each site individually, we're gonna. This is, graph indicates the average of each site over the years. So on the x-axis is once again the forty-year time period, and then on the y-axis we have the average butterfly abundance of all sites for that year. Um, these graphs look pretty steep, but in they're really more visually like deceptive than what they really are indicating. So we have the fall in the pink and the blue is the spring. Um, once again, the confidence interval for the spring is a lot larger just due to the smaller sample size. So for the fall, annually, there's a decline of 1.83% butterflies. Um, this just means year over year, there would be a 1.83% decline in butterfly abundance. Um, there's also every one centimeter of monsoon precipitation increases abundance by 2.3%. So this means the fall abundance is really relying on monsoon precipitation. Uh, and then every party hour increases abundance by 3.56%. So this kind of ties back to the party hour uh, graphs that we showed earlier, indicating how important party hours are. As we saw, they were decreasing over time. And this is that's really one of the main players in overall abundance decreasing over time. And then spring, there's a decrease of 9.35%. However, this number looks large and scary, but this is just once again due down due to the fact that there was only 17 samplings. So the, the time frame and the amount of samples wasn't necessarily large enough to give us a discrete value. And one 
centimeter of winter precipitation increases abundance by 4%. And every party hour increases abundance by 4.61%. So we can really start to see how party hours or time that volunteers spend out in the field surveying are playing a large role in this, which makes sense because the, the more exposure you have out, the more you're likely to see. Now that we've talked about abundance, we're gonna start with site richness. So on the x-axis, we'll have the sites again, and y-axis, we'll have richness, indicating unique species seen in a surveying event. So once again, the preserve is towards the bottom, but this is also follows the same trend of the party hours, where you have sites such as Patagonia and Ramsey Canyon at the top. But we, if you remember, they were the, high, the two sites with the highest party hours as well. But then when we look at the spring graph, the preserve has a lot more variance in the unique species that sees compared to the abundance, where there was hardly even a box, it was just a line. Whereas and now Sabino Canyon has a lot less variance with their unique species compared to their abundance. So now once again, looking at overall richness, similar to the overall abundance, we have the average butterfly richness on the y-axis, which is average out through the sides. And once again, these lines are pretty steep. But then when you look at the statistics, the fall in the fall model, there's really a negligible decline in species richness annually. And there's also a negligible increase in species richness due to winter precipitation. And honestly, with the party hours, it's pretty small too. So every party hour the surveyors spend out in the field, they will increase the richness by 0.0015 species. If you're curious for these negligible, so this indicates one species every 47,000 years. So, and then it also indicates one new species every 34,000 centimeters of rain. Whereas with the spring, once again, the sampling size was smaller, but there's a richness decline of 2.16 species every year. And there's also every 2.31 centimeters of winter precipitation increases the richness by one species. So this is in showing you how important the precipitation totals are. And then every party hour increase is richness by 0.76 species. So every additional hour that volunteers spend out surveying, they would see on average 0.76 more species. So now that we visually looked at them, I just want to kind of explain them again, or explain the results again. So as we talked, observer effort was a strong predictor for both butterfly richness and abundance. We saw in the graphs how they followed a similar pattern to the party hours. And this just means the more time observers spent in the field, the larger the values for both butterfly abundance and richness. And then when looking at the climate variables, precipitation had the largest effect on butterfly abundance and richness. It wasn't necessarily temperature as we originally may have thought. It was more so monsoon precipitation had a, was the key precipitation on fall abundance, while winter precipitation was the important uh, precipitation value for spring abundance and fall and spring richness. So when comparing our results to the initial Forrester paper that Dr. Rowe mentioned, they initially saw a 1.6 decline of the Southwest United States. Obviously, Arizona is in the Southwest United States, and we saw the 1.83% decline. So our results are pretty similar in a line with what their findings saw. Um, so now we're just gonna talk about what does this mean moving forward? So the future, there's uh, three main ways to maintain these butterfly populations. The first would be conservation measures. Uh, breaking this down would be maintaining a large habitat patch size, maintaining the quality of natural areas, and maintain corridors and natural connections among natural areas. Uh, a second key way to uh, conserve these populations would be to minimize climate change. Um, any way we can, this allows for a large, larger adaptation period for these species, which gives them a higher chance of survival. And then the third way we can do is ensuring reserves. So any additional resources um, can help mitigate the effects of climate change and once again, give them a increased survival rate. Uh, so, Doctor, that was all that we had. Um, Dr. Rowe will now talk about the next steps of this experiment, and then we'll open it up to questions. Okay. Oh. 
All right. So um, thank you, Bradley. That was great. Um, I, we have tons of questions coming in the chat, but before we get to those, I just wanted to uh, finish this up. I really wish I had a butterfly like Jesse had to, to show her way around, but I don't. Um, <laughs> but where this brings us is that we had our butterfly and we've been monitoring them. And then we took our results and we did some analysis. Um, but there's further analysis that we um, that we want to do. So uh, together with my collaborator, uh, Dr. Broach, we would like to dig down into um, species level uh, results um, to see if we can sort of pick out which species are um, sort of more in decline um, in our region. Uh, that and that can lead us. Um, to even more sort of management actions that we can think about for those species. Um, so that's our, those are our next steps. And I wanna open it up for questions. And um, so is somebody else gonna monitor the chat and then ask questions to Bradley and us? And um, that was done. Yeah, thank you, Helen, and thank you, Bradley. That was very informative. I think uh, uh, we have time for one question. Uh, I, I see one here was addressed in chat, but I'll, I'll uh, relay it to you. It's how much data will be needed to separate short term, uh, in other words, seasonal annual weather effects from long term climate change effects? Sorry. Um so how much data will be needed to separate short-term seasonal? So are you talking spring versus fall or? Sorry, yeah, I, I think that one. would be an example. Okay, yeah, so as we talked, there was only 10 years in the spring and there's 40 years in the fall. So I think that would be a good measure right around that 40 year mark. That's the same value that Forrester used. And then along with that, you would just, get more samplings because we had 17 in the 10 year period. Um, and if we, if we, if you don't mind me butting in, there was a lot of talk about party hours and ways that we could um, think about that. But I do want to emphasize the fact that due to the fact that we had party hours in the model, it meant that we were able to separate that variation from what we were seeing in the overall decline by year and the decline that we could attribute to precipitation. And so because it was in the model, it doesn't, it's not necessary um, actually that everybody has the same party hours. By including it, we can sort of tell um, still what these trends mean. And so those trends that Bradley were showing, those are real, those percentages that were attributable to um, annual declines and to precipitation, um, those are separated out from the party hours. So um, those still remain real butterfly declines, sadly. Excellent. Well, um, thank you, Melanie. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Fastigi, and I'm the Restoration Manager at the Conservancy. Um, I wanted to also introduce Debbie Langenfeld, who's our Steward Restoration Lead. And Debbie has years of experience in helping us with our uh, experimental research, and will be able to share a lot of information on, on why we do experiments at the Conservancy. So uh, first, experimental research. Um, when and why do we take an experimental approach to our work? Um, we do experimental research when we need to ask targeted research questions. And so some examples could include um, asking questions about seeding techniques um, and what enhances seed establishment. Another one might be um, what invasive plant removal method is the most cost effective, but also the least impactful on the native plant community. Um, so these are questions that uh, we've actually designed um, to help inform preserve management. And um, for all of these experiments, we work with scientific partners, experts in their field, like, um, like Dr. Rowe, actually, like uh, Helen. Um, and we then make sure that we are designing and implementing rigorous projects. 
And so one of the most unique and valuable aspects of our work is the fact that our experimental research and data collection is occurring within the preserve itself. Um, and because of this, our data and the results that we are compiling are directly applicable to the decision making that um, the city of Scottsdale um, is able to take and use for managing the preserve. And so you could say that it's customized to the preserve, but at the same time uh, can also be more broadly applicable. And we make sure that all of our work is published in peer reviewed academic journals, um, which makes that work available to the broader academic and land manager network. So um, you've heard from Jesse and Helen about our experimental work um, with bats and arthropods, and uh, also from Bradley about uh, the butterfly work and results on that. Um, and for this presentation, we're gonna be using examples from our invasive plant projects and restoration to show how our experimental work contributes to the preserve management um, and to see how it fits within the adaptive management framework that we've been talking about today. So um, many of you are familiar with invasive plants in the preserve and invasive plant species are a major threat to the preserve and the Sonoran Desert as a whole. Um, they really outcompete native plants, they increase wildfire risk and um, they spread quickly. So um, one study that we uh, started to engage in about four or five years ago is our fountain grass study. Um, and it was designed to find out what removal techniques were the most cost effective and least impactful to the native plant community, like we said at the beginning. Um, and so this experiment ran from March 2018 until March 2021. And we set up five meter by five meter plots in quartz wash to test the efficacy and record the costs of common removal techniques. So cutting and herbiciding, herbiciding one time, two times per year, manual removal are examples of uh, the techniques that we were testing. And uh, Helen led this and the results were published last year in Biological Invasions. And we found that all the treatments for fountain grass were effective, um, but the choice of what removal method you wanted to use really depended more on the scale of the issue and uh, what your project resources were for that individual project. Um, and also really importantly with this project, uh, the native plant communities recovered after removals, which is what we really want to see if we're putting in that time and resources into removals. Um, another problematic species that we have in the preserve is buffalo grass. Um, and you'll hear more about buffalo grass today. And it's a very resilient and difficult to remove plant. Uh, similar to the fountain grass study, we wanted to be able to provide land managers with information on the most cost effective removal methods that also protects our native plant communities. And so this study uh, ran for five years. We actually just, just stopped it and uh, stopped the, the experimental work for the paper, I should say. Um, and we also had five meter by five meter plots and we compared the same things, the efficacy of the treatments, the cost and the impact to the native vegetation uh, in the same types of uh, different combinations of manual removal, cutting and herbicide. And we're really excited to say that just this month, the manuscript uh, was accepted and published in Biological Invasions. So we'll be able to share out that link very soon. Um, and we should emphasize that in the case of the buffalo grass study, not any of the treatments were completely effective at removing the grass. And so we are actually continuing um, treatments to see if we can get to zero. Uh, but what we did find is that herbiciding three times a year uh, resulted after five years in um, buffalo grass levels that were similar to the plots that we had as controls from the beginning of the project. Uh, we also know that pulling was the least uh, effective, but that um, the native plant cover and the richness did recover after removals in plots. And so our goal for both of these projects is to provide information and a toolkit that helps managers to select which treatment uh, is the most um, applicable to their project. So you want to balance convenience, resources, and uh, the scale of the uh, infestation that you have before you decide which method makes the most sense for your project. Uh, and so we'll also take a look at the results of several of our restoration experiments. Uh, so before we get into that, I thought we should just quickly cover what is restoration um, and why would we worry about degraded lands and restoring them in the first place. Um, you've heard from several of our speakers before that biodiversity is really experiencing a massive loss. 
And so habitat degradation is one of the primary causes of species extinctions and the loss of biodiversity. And so if you have habitat loss or fragmentation, um, or even areas that haven't completely been degraded, but you've lost some species through urbanization, agriculture, recreation, et cetera, uh, you end up with less habitat for animals, you have less space for plants and that biodiversity, and so you end up with less species, and uh, it generally leads to population declines. So we have mapped um, in a couple different ways um, how to identify where degraded lands are. One way to categorize degraded land is as open, obvious disturbances from things like off-road vehicles, unauthorized trails, camping, um, different uses of the preserve before it was a preserve. And so we have actually published on a citizen science driven approach to look at where these types of disturbances are using aerial and satellite imagery. And we have found approximately 70 acres that fit this criteria. Uh, and those areas might look something like this from an aerial perspective or satellite perspective on the left side and on the right side, um, you could have an old road scar that you can see kind of visually right here. Uh, another way that you can uh, categorize a disturbance is areas that haven't lost all of their species, but have a different uh, species community than maybe they originally had before a disturbance. So one might be from ranching. And so this is a map that shows where the heaviest ranching uh, impacts were in the preserve. And underneath that, um, if you can kind of see there's some red hash marks and those show where there have been fires in the preserve. And so some restoration projects could look at restoring plants um, that are missing from those communities to boost the biodiversity. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Debbie, who is going to walk us through four of our restoration experiments and their results so that we can see how we can use those um, in our restoration toolkit. Oh, so can you hear me? So hello, everybody. Um, and as Mary said, I'm going to talk about four of our sites, starting with the first one, past restoration. So in this case, we were able to evaluate the results of restoration areas of the preserve treated between 2011 and 2012. So these were, as Mary said, as the picture on the right shows, previously used roads or parking areas. Four treatment methods were used, and I see that they, are they dropping off the bottom of your screen? Um, the one on the left is debris. Uh, it was, a dead, we added dead tree branches that created this kind of nursery environment for seed germination. The soil was ripped to improve water infiltration. We added seeds, they add, at, when this was done, they added seeds, and then cat just mainly uh, buckhorn, choya was added as well. So you can see really from the picture on the right, that even after 10 plus years of restoration, the communities are not meshing between the restored area and the natural areas on either side. Uh, we found that seeding was relatively unsuccessful. Our biggest success was that succulents reestablished. And then, um, this is great. We have a manuscript that was published if you want to read more information about this in American Midland Naturalists in 2020. So our second study then is the closed trail restoration study. This was a project in the northernmost area of the preserve, and it was a four-year study from July 2016 to March of 2020 to determine best practices for compacted areas or compacted trails. Uh, three treatment techniques were used in our plots that we set up. Um, one was ripping, as you can see, we put the soil for better um, moisture retention and uh, infiltration using a weasel. Um, we then, uh, salvage some topsoil containing seed banks, that middle one representing seed bank soil from under nearby trees. And then we added some commercial seeds that uh, we took painstaking details to mix them with, uh, to mix them, these seeds so that they mirrored the natural vegetation of the surrounding landscape. So the results of this study were kind of a little surprising. We found that the use of local seed bank soil uh, was effective and shows promise as a cheap but relatively labor intensive method and not relatively, it's a real labor intensive method. Uh, by the end of the four years, all of the plots, including those that didn't receive any treatments resembled the surrounding natural area. 
So that tells us that limiting access is one of, is really an important consideration in restoration efforts. Fewer than half of the seeded species established and um, persisted over time. And that's kind of the same finding that we found from the seed perspective in past restoration as well. And then the unripped plots had higher native plant growth and lower non-native growth. So as Helen said, they unripped one. Um, I was kind of surprised about that. I actually thought that the ripped ones would be, do better. So I guess that's why you have to do research and not just implement your assumptions. We have um, also a published paper for this study on, on restoration ecology in 2021. So the next study, the project that we're working with is called RestoreNet. The USGS, uh, there you have a team, project is called Restora Restoration Assessment and Monitoring Program. And they are testing restoration treatments in 24, 25 dry southwestern ecosystems. And we are one of the Granite Mountain, near the Granite Mountain Trail. They used uh, four different treatments, including mulch on the left there to help with moisture retention. Then these weird things called con mods that act as uh, artificial nurse plants, and these wire structures that look like they're kind of like the debris that we use in uh, past restoration. Um, pits to help retain moisture, and then a couple of different seed mixes. So what did best? Well, really of the 25 sites that preserve uh, have the highest seedling establishment, and that what established annual forbs and grasses did the best, including chia and senna and desert marigold. And from a grasses perspective, uh, purple freon, for example. Um, the pit treatment did the best across the entire network, though. And we are now working with them on phase two, which is the testing of the effectiveness of using seed balls. You can see in that picture on the right. There are those little white dots or these seed balls that we're testing. Uh, USGS has published the results um, and the Conservancy is in process of doing that as well. Now, um, you may hear more about this. Sorry, Mary, you may have heard a little bit more about, you may hear a little bit more about this from Seth Munson, who was on the panel speaking in the next section, one of the next sections. Um, and the fourth then is my favorite subject, biocrust reintroduction. So as uh, most of you know, we're working with researchers from North America, Northern Arizona University, including Ms. Helen and Tanika, fa fantastic research partner. And she may have seen um, both of them presenting in uh, Lunch and Learn a few months ago. So biocrust has such important qualities that it really needs to be included in the restoration toolkit. But biocrust isn't easy to come by. It takes a real long time to grow. You can't go out and buy it. And it makes no sense to just transplant it from one place to another. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. So what do you do? Well, you try to cultivate it. So that's what we did. So at Scottsdale Community College in 2018, we laid out our experiment using three different cultivation systems. So on the bottom, I'm sure you can see it, but the one on the left says flat. The, then we built these hoop, house, hoop houses, the one in the middle. And then we also took some biopress up to greenhouse at MAU. And the plots had different combinations. So we laid out this wheat cloth and a weed cloth, and then the plots had different combinations of native soil and sand, and with or without jute. And then on top of that, we sieved some biocrust that we salvaged in at Fraysfield in 2018 again, and then put that on top. Um, the results were fantastic. All cultivation, all three cultivation methods at least doubled biocrust cover in only 11 weeks. Uh, and native soil was found to be not really all that critical. And jute was found to be not necessary, but jute creates this kind of biocrust fabric that lets us move it around quite easily and transport it quite easily. So all of these results and findings were that we found that there was the ability and possible to do some scaling up. 
which is really great. And so right now, uh, you know, different, many different possibilities for using BioCrust. So right now we are one of the is that we're cultivating BioCrust sod at Scottsdale Community College, and we're going to be taking that out to Toronto and um, laying it out to help to see if we can do some living fire, build some living fire breaks. Um, and the manuscript for this is being written right now for publication. And Mary, I think that's back to you. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so I just wanted to add a couple like key takeaways before moving on to the next, next presentation. Um, the first is that we know that land management, especially restoration um, and invasive plant removal is difficult in arid environments like the Sonoran Desert. Um, so our experimental research uh, adds new fundamental knowledge. Jesse was talking about the importance of that for adaptive management. <laughs> Um, to the toolkit for uh, decision making. So we're also working in a dynamic and changing natural resource system. So understanding what con conditions exist and um, being able to understand what techniques might work best in each of those different conditions is a critical piece for adaptive management um, and for understanding best management practices. And so we can take what we've learned from our restoration experiments and apply them uh, while also continuously learning along the way. Um, and so that iterative learning process is uh, helping us to kind of prioritize areas that we want to do research in the next couple of years. Um, in the next presentation, you'll hear a bit more about our next steps for invasive plant management. So I left that off of here. But uh, for restoration, we're planning to take what we've learned from our experiments and apply them in several upcoming projects. The first is living labs, and you'll be hearing from um, some students from Scottsdale Unified School District, Saguaro High School. And we're working with them to research and test uh, nurse plant associations uh, with cacti, both it's gonna be in the preserve and then also at schools within the district. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we will be publishing on results from that during for that partnership. We're also going to be continuing our partnership with uh, NAU. Um, we have such great researchers there who are working on BioCrust, the seed reestablishment. Um, and we're also going to develop seed sourcing guidance for the preserve. Um, and last, uh, we always have to communicate what we're doing. And so we're gonna continue to publish. We're gonna continue to make sure we are uh, making our findings available and uh, working with the city of Scottsdale on uh, experiments that make sense for uh, best management practices in the preserve and beyond. So this is the last part. And if you think back to the, um, the kind of adaptive management cycle, um, that management, um, you know, actions or management recommendations, part of it was really key. And we have a number of projects that are not only in this section, kind of where they're addressing management questions, but they may be seen in other sections as well. So for example, earlier, um, whoops to figure out which screen I have the changes going on. There we go, okay. For example, earlier we talked about uh, the invasive species experiments, which we uh, took that approach early on in our, um, you know, in, in our work, uh, because we had some questions that we really needed answered in that experimental approach. And now we're moving into um, more of a um, management action plus monitoring sort of cycle where we're, we're implementing the things that we found out during the experiments and we're continuously monitoring throughout. I'm gonna go into that just a little bit, but I do wanna say that these are some of our other projects that are also somewhere in the management action slash um, you know, experimental approach uh, uh, section. And those would be arthropods, bats, um, wildlife cameras, and tortoises. Uh, you'll be hearing more about those in the upcoming year because they're very visible projects. Um, you know, keep an eye out for our lunch and learns and things like that. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but our invasive species, um, is just a really good example of that. Um, I'm going to have John Loylette from the city of Scottsdale and Paul Staker 
uh, take it from here, and they are going to explain how we went from, you know, uh, finding the results of our experiment that Mary's, uh, Mary shared with us just a little bit ago um, to what we are doing now and the expanded approach that we are taking with the city of Scottsdale and what kind of an impact that's having. So from there, um, John and Paul, take it away and just let me know when you want me to flip the slide. Good afternoon, everyone. I am John Lolet, and many of you know that uh, I am at the Pima Dynamite Trailhead. And um, I've, as, as a representative of the city of management, I guess that's kind of an interesting spot for me to be in. I can tell you that, um, and many of you know, uh, the city has been committed to this project literally since day one. When we started to put our heads together and figure out we have, gonna have, will have a problem with invasive species, we were ready to go and uh, see what it was gonna take to get that thing, uh, to get it taken care of, to manage it, all of that stuff. Uh, it is nice to know that the commitment that we have, the city has, is not just at the preserve staff level, but it goes all the way up into management in the city. And part of our management directive is to keep and preserve biodiversity um, in the preserve. So we are totally committed with this project and many of the other projects that are going on out there. And so, in other words, you can count on the city still being there. So um, we look at this as a very long-term project. Uh, we have put in, as you well know, um, we work together to put in uh, money for grants that, uh, especially the DFFM grant that we recently uh, received, we've got that money. We will use general funds and potentially the uh, uh, money for from uh, the preserve tax to keep these projects going and stay on top of uh, the invasives. So we're going to we're going to stay with it, and we're long term on this project. Uh, with the DFFM uh, grant, uh, it seemed that because we had a lot of our ducks in a row because of all the tremendous amount of work that the Conservancy and the stewards have done, mapping and finding out where all these invasives are, uh, Willie was quite uh, impressed at how organized, how uh, directed, and how committed we were to this project. And so many times it seems that other areas will see a problem. They might have a couple of years of money to work with and let's see what we can do for just a couple of years. We look at it as we're going on with this thing as long as it takes. So I think that impressed Willie and he liked the fact that we were gonna be around long-term. So um, we're going to be there. Uh, that grant was $192,000, I believe, something like that. And we had to put a 25% match in on that, which was not hard at all because many of the stewards, Paul's crew were out there, their hours dedicated to this will easily match that uh, percentage that we've got to do. So. Um, we are, our priorities are, the city's priorities with the invasives is, I think there's about 10 invasives that are on the list. You know which ones we are going after uh, and the others that are out there that we happen to come across, they're in trouble too. <laughs> but we, we tend to focus a lot on buffel, uh, stink net and the uh, fountain grass, but there's a number of them out there that we are, uh, going to engage should we come across them. Uh, what, uh, what I do is, this is tied in just ever so slightly with fire. And especially in the North area, I will spray along the APS and WAPA power lines, some of the trails that are wide enough to take the spray truck. 
I am spraying those shoulders to increase our fire break. If there happens to be invasives in those shoulders that my spray hits, that's good for us. So we're trying to reduce fire as well as take care of some of those invasives that tend to be a fire hazard to us as well. So um, I work very closely with Paul and the other sprayers that are out there uh, arranging uh, chemicals that, that they need, uh, some of the training that, they, that we all have to go through every year and stuff. So I work closely with this crew that I, I won't say is dedicated. I, I'll have to say that they are vengeful. Uh, if I was an invasive in the preserve, I would be a little nervous. I see how much time and effort, relentless effort that the stewards put into going out to these various areas, sniffing out, hunting down and finding so many of the invasives that are growing out there and using some of the apps like field maps on, on the phone. The way this ties back is that uh, the sprayers will be out there. They will put into field maps, patches or bunches or wherever they saw various invasives that are growing. And when we have contractors come in with that DFFM grant, they don't have to go out there and search. We've got the maps already set up for them. They already know exactly where they need to go and spray. And uh, as you all know, the preserve is not just all flat, simple, easy, open trails. These guys are going out into the roughest terrain that's out there. And uh, they, they do a phenomenal job. The hundreds and hundreds of hours that they put into that is uh, absolutely remarkable. The city could not do this project alone. Uh, the stewards in the Conservancy has been an invaluable force in helping us be as successful as we possibly can with this project. So I hope I summed that up pretty good for everybody. I would like to pass on to Paul very quickly that in a, one of the previous uh, uh, presentations, they kept, and I'm sorry I walked in partly uh, when it was almost over, but they kept referring it to a party. Uh, I wish going after these invasives was more like a party, but. I guess if we have to keep our spirits up, we'll call it that from now on. But thank you all very much. And thank all the stewards and Paul and your crew for going out there doing the tremendous amount of work that you guys do. Okay, thank you, John. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and it is a party out there when we uh, are going after the plants. Um, I'm going to continue the discussion with a little history, a little more history of how our management of invasive plants has evolved over the years. Uh, and as I go through this, uh, I really hope that two themes continue to be obvious as I discuss it. Uh, first, as John has described, we this really is a partnership between the city and the uh, conservancy, both the staff and the stewards. Uh, we really could not have accomplished what we have without the cooperation and coordination we have between the two of us, the two groups. Uh, and second, uh, going back to all the previous discussion that we've had on our adaptive management strategy approach, uh, I think this is a maybe as good an example of how we actually have started to move from the science stage into development of the adaptive management plan to the fact that we actually are already getting a lot of work uh, done and be, are beginning to learn from what we've accomplished. Uh, and we're continuing to adapt that plan as we gain more experience and learn from our results. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about primarily is on our two invasive grasses, uh, buffalo grass and fountain grass, because that's where the uh, two, uh, those are the two invasives that are the largest issues and the ones that we've been working on the longest. I'm going to go all the way back in time, um, really to set sort of set the stage for this, all the way back to about 2010, uh, which is when I actually became a conservancy steward. Uh, by uh, coincidence, it also was about the time that Melanie mentioned the Field Institute was established. 
Uh, but I actually first became aware of the concerns about invasive grasses in the preserve through the Conservancy's construction and maintenance program. Uh, one of the irregular activities of that group at the time, being led by city preserve staff, was to go up and go out and physically dig up the plants uh, and remove them. Uh, that work was about as physically demanding as anything we did, since it's not easy to remove a large plant that's buried under a huge rock in the middle of a steep wash in remote territory. But the thing that actually bothered me the most about what we were doing was that I saw that if we didn't return to an area for a couple of years after doing one of these removal projects, all the grass had grown back and you couldn't really tell that anything had ever been done there. So I was interested when I heard that, that the Conservancy's Field Institute staff was going to start up a group to study the invasive plant issue from a more scientific perspective. The Field Institute was still fairly new at that time and invasive plants had not previously been a major area of focus. Melanie and Helen were the uh, Field Institute staff back at that time. And as I say, they decided to set up this study group to first review the literature to see what was out there to possibly guide us on what we should be doing. There were a fair number of scientific papers that had been published on buffalo grass, particularly from the University of Arizona in Tucson, since it has started to be recognized as a real concern down there. But many of these were relatively short-term studies that lasted only as long as the money from a grant covered the cost or as a grad student stayed in school. And there was even less on fountain grass, most, most of which was focused on how it was invading areas in Hawaii, which you have to agree has a somewhat different ecosystem than what we have here in Arizona. So to make a long story short, we decided we would conduct two long-term experiments one on each of those grasses. I'm not gonna cover each of those in detail. Mary summarized them briefly before. Uh, we have mentioned several times that we've had papers recently published on both the fountain grass and the buffalo grass studies, uh, but we did learn quite a bit from those. And the one thing that I wanna focus on the most because it has had the most impact on what we've actually been doing is the con strong conclusion that the best technique for getting rid of the grasses is herbicide application rather than physical removal. And I know that herbicide can be a controversial subject. So I'm gonna to return to some of the study results and how they address this issue. Most importantly, it seems to be more effective in killing the grass and reducing the amount of new growth, particularly for buffalo grass, since it is very difficult to remove all the underground rhizome root system when physically removing it. Herbicide, on the other hand, gets absorbed into the plant's vascular system and should kill the entire plant if applied correctly. The study also determined that herbicide should be more cost-effective than plant removal for anything other than very small populations. Uh, however, the numbers get a little bit whacked up uh, when the uh, Cheap steward labor is factored into it since uh, you can do a lot of physical labor uh, for not much cost uh, if stewards are willing to do it. Uh, but for somebody out in the field doing the work, the thing that I really value is the enhanced efficiency of the effort. The rule of thumb that we've developed through experience and through the studies is that one herbicide applicator can do the work of about 10 people physically out pulling the plants. That's a huge difference when you are faced with the scope of the populations that we are trying to remove. But I also want to address a couple of the concerns that are expressed about herbicide. First, I commonly hear concerns about the ecological impact of using herbicide on the other native plants that may be near the invasive grasses that we are treating. Fortunately, our studies showed that this impact was neutral to maybe even positive as native plants began to return after the invasives were removed. And I know that herbicide exposure can be a personal concern. You hear about some of the lawsuits on the news, uh, but although this is a very personal issue, those of us who are involved with this work are comfortable with the efforts to reduce this risk through appropriate use of personal protective equipment and work practices. This is one where our relationship with the city is really critical. Uh, they have been very actively involved with us in providing that PPE uh, that we use and with annual safety training that we all received. So going into the herbicide process in a little more depth, 
Uh, the city requires that all stewards who participate in herbicide application be certified under the Arizona State Department of Agriculture licensing program. This requires passing a test that focuses a lot on personal safety and proper use of the chemicals. Hen stewards are now certified, including three recent additions who will be joining the team for the first time for our work in the fall. And as John has mentioned, the city is very supportive of what we are doing as we legally are all working under the direction of the license that the city has with the state. This slide that you see right now up on the screen kind of summarizes the uh, key results uh, from what we've accomplished over really the last, this is approaching four or five years now uh, that we've been doing this work. Uh, we have treated at least once uh, approximately 500 acres uh, over that time. Uh, what we have learned is that you absolutely need, we absolutely need to, need to be doing follow-up monitoring and retreatment. It will come back. It'll be a little less every year, but it needs to be done. Uh, and so we do as much of that as possible every year, going back to all the acres. Of course, every year that we add new acres, uh, that means more monitoring and retreatment. Uh, we've been consistently uh, recognizing over a thousand steward labor hours per year. Uh, and uh, in, as, a, as we look at what we've accomplished, I have used the word in quotes there under control in several major areas. The one that you're looking up on the screen, a little hard to see in context, uh, but the map there shows the Browns Mountain area, uh, which is one of the areas where there has been buffalo grass for many, many years. There's a large concentration to the right, right underneath the trail. Uh, that's what you're seeing there. And then a whole bunch of patches out further to the west. Uh, this area in my mind is under control. I was up there this uh, spring. Uh, did I see some new growth? Yes, uh, but much, much less than what we had seen before. Uh, and it really took very little time to uh, try to attack what I saw out there. And as I think was mentioned earlier, uh, the team did receive recognition from the Southwest Vegetation Management Association uh, as weed manager of the year for all the work that we've accomplished. Go on to the next slide. Uh, John already introduced the uh, DFFM grant, so I'm not going to have to go into that in too much detail. Uh, but what we did recognize, again, working together, the city and the conservancy, uh, was that although we have accomplished quite a bit with those 500 acres I just mentioned, uh, there is much more work to be done. Unfortunately, one of the things that we've experienced is we continue to find buffalo grass in new areas that, we, that we've never seen it before, uh, as it seems to be spreading throughout the preserve. Uh, this is something that we have not just experienced here, but I've heard about it elsewhere uh, throughout the valley and in other areas of the state. Uh, that buffalo grass is, is gaining if you don't start to get control over it. Uh, so uh, in order to accelerate our, the efforts that the stewards have put into this, we recognize uh, that it would be great if we could bring in outside contractors uh, to do additional herbicide application, uh, particularly on very large populations in difficult areas. Uh, but uh, outside contractors do cost money which of course requires a source of funds. Uh, so we began to talk about how we might be able to apply for grant funds to cover some of the cost. Uh, the city actually had some money back in early 2022 uh, from a, some money that had been provided from APS uh, related to the power line corridor up in the north area of the preserve. At that point in time in the spring of 2022, we were actually able to bring in some young trainees uh, from the Arizona Conservation Experience, who did some work on the buffalo grass on Mount Rounds Mountain, which is one of the main reasons why we've seen so much progress there. Uh, but unfortunately, those APS dollars were restricted uh, by agreement to the North Area. And most of the grass issues that we have in the preserve are in the McDowells. Uh, so as John mentioned, we took advantage of the opportunity to apply for grant funds or under an initiative put out by the Arizona Department, Department of Forestry and Fire Management, the DFFM. Um, an interesting thing to note, just as a side note, uh, in this particular application was it was focused on work in the forests in Arizona. 
Uh, there are obviously areas of Arizona that are more truly forested than what we have, uh, but fortunately DFM uh, counted saguaros uh, as forests because we have such large populations of those. And uh, it obviously is a concern because we know that fires have done significant damage over the years to the uh, saguaro populations. So just a couple more details on that grant process. Uh, the city, uh, if we haven't made it clear, I think everybody knows, is the landowner and the manager of the preserve. So they were technically the applicant for the grant funds. Uh, but this truly was a joint effort where city staff and conservancy staff and stewards worked together in preparing the application. A critical part of the preparation was our first comprehensive strategic plan that covered how we would continue to attack the invasive grass issue. And as the map on the left shows, we specifically identified four project areas as the spots where we would focus the initial contractor work if we were successful in receiving the grant funds. And as John mentioned, the application required the demonstration of matching funds uh, to supplement the money that would be provided by the state, which was relatively easy to get to, uh, given all the contributions of the conservancy, particularly from the stewards. Uh, the result was that DFM was very impressed by what we had already accomplished and what our future plans envisioned. And as mentioned, we successfully received a grant close to the maximum amount available under the program. Using these funds, the city contracted with a company called Enviro Systems out of Flagstaff. Again, both Conservancy and, and city were very involved in developing the planning process for what they should be doing. Uh, one additional activity uh, was a couple of helicopter water drops that were done to deliver water to the areas where the work would be done, since getting the water necessary to mix with the herbicide concentrate is one of the biggest challenges of this type of effort. Uh, the city's contractor, I'm sorry, contract with the helicopter pilot was also paid for through the DFFM grant. So as of right now, Enviro Systems has completed approximately two thirds of the planned work covered by the grant. Uh, they did this through working three sessions of approximately five to 10 days each uh, and sprayed over 300 acres. Uh, based on the overall results of that uh, and the fact that we're always looking for more help from a financial perspective, uh, we certainly plan to work together to go after additional grant opportunities in the future. We can go to the last slide. Uh, very, very briefly, just go over a couple other aspects of our activity. Our regional partnerships with other land managers and conservation organizations in the area is critical to our success. Uh, one item I didn't mention previously, I think John mentioned it very briefly, is the active role that we played in developing a phone app that may be easily used by stewards and others to survey and map the location of invasives so we know where the work needs to be done. One of our regional partners has been actively involved with us in development and continued to refinement of this product. Uh, and it's now been shared with many others throughout the Valley. Uh, our regional group called De Desert Defenders uh, meets regularly to share best practices so we can all learn from each other's experiences, as well as to jointly develop materials, educational materials that can be used to educate governmental leaders and the general public about the threat of invasives and what can be done about them. A specific area of focus right now that I haven't really covered, uh, we did mention it uh, earlier, is the rapid spread of stink net, uh, which is a very invasive annual flowering plant. Uh, it does pose a real threat to desert ecology and can become a major fire hazard, uh, but the best techniques for removing it are much less developed than for the grasses. Uh, so we're all working together to try to figure out how best to try to control it. I mentioned public education. We're expanding our efforts to work with HOAs, businesses, others that are located near the preserve, since of course the invasives do not recognize and respect the boundaries that have arbitrarily been established between the undeveloped area of the preserve and the developed areas that surround us. So that's all I have. Don't know, Lars, if we have any time for questions, but we're available either through chat or otherwise, if necessary. No, thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, Melanie and John. Paul, we all appreciate your hard work and leadership in this area. Um, due to time, I think we'll try to answer any remaining questions through chat. I do see some uh, compliments on the hard work there. So 
Um, yeah, we'll attempt to answer them via chat. And I guess at this point, uh, back to you, Melanie. And we're just going to go right into the panel. And today we have a really excellent panel of partners. You've heard a lot about our work in the preserve. They're going to share with you their experiences um, with their organizations uh, working with the Conservancy and what these partnerships mean, you know, to uh, the work outside of the preserve and why these types of partnerships are so important. So I'm going to turn it back to Doug Jensen, who's going to be emceeing the panel and go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you, Melanie. We're going to introduce our panelists. First, we have Chally Facemeyer, who's the program director for the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance. And she leads their effort to facilitate collaboration among the Alliance partners, as well as implementation of the regional open space strategy. She comes from an interdisciplinary research background, studying landscape scale land management, environmental and natural resource law and policy, physical and legal boundary impacts on ecosystems and collaborative conservation. Our next panelist is Kathy Gerst. She's the conservation research coordinator <clears throat> for, the, for the Bat Conservation International and Southwest Bat Hub coordinator of the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Kathy is an ecologist who cultivates strong partnerships across science and management applications in the Southwest. She aims to bring together stakeholders, researchers, and agencies. She enthusiastically promotes the use of standardized monitoring protocols and data accessibility. She received her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona in 2011. Over the past 20 years, her work and interests have led her to carry out field research across mountains, deserts, and tropical forests. Our next panelist is Seth Munson, who is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Seth is an ecologist with the Southwest Biological Science Center and Flagstaff. His research focuses on plant-soil interactions in dry land ecosystems and how these interactions are affected by climate and land use changes. Much of Dr. Munson's research aims to understand the dynamics of dry land ecosystems along temporal and broad spatial scales and employs a multidisciplinary approach. His work seeks to improve the management of arid and semi-arid lands, including determining effective ecological restoration strategies, and is done in close collaboration with several land management agencies. Next, we have Aaron Posthumus, who is the outreach coordinator for the National Phenology Network. It is a national science initiative based at the University of Arizona. The National Phenology Network focuses on collecting, organizing, and delivering phenological data, information, and forecasts to support natural resource management and decision-making to advance the scientific field of phenology and to promote understanding of phenology by a wide range of audiences. Aaron has a background in wildlife conservation and management and has worked for the Nas National Phenology Network since 2010. One of her favorite parts of work is supporting local phonology programs such as that in our conservancy. We then have Ron Rutowski, Arizona State University Emeritus Professor and President of the Central Arizona Butterfly Association. Ron got his, P <clears throat> Ron got his PhD at Cornell University <clears throat> I'm having a little problem here. Sorry. Ron got his PhD at Cornell University and joined the faculty in life sciences at ASU in 1976. His primary teaching responsibilities were in invertebrate zoology and animal behavior. His research focused on production, function, <clears throat> and perception of bright coloration in animals, especially butterflies. 
This work has been done on multiple continents and yielded over 100 publications and scientific literature. He retired from full-time faculty <clears throat> responsibilities in 2016, but has remained active in teaching and research in the life sciences in a number of ways, including providing scientific guidance and participation in butterfly counts in central Arizona, such as those done in the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. And then I'm not certain if Vicki is with us. I'm here. Good. Vicki Olmsted is the Senior Environmental Specialist for Wildlife Management on the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa Indian Community. She has been in her position for almost two years. And before that, she was a wildlife biologist for the United States Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services in New York City. She has held a variety of wildlife positions in 11 different states, focusing on population demography and conservation management of threatened and endangered species, as well as habitat management and restoration. She has a BS in wildlife conservation from the University of Delaware and a master in science in wildlife biology from Arkansas Tech University. So we're going to have the opportunity to ask a number of questions of our panelists. Uh, to start this off, I will ask one fairly broad question, and then we will open it up for questions from our audience through the chat room. So the question I have for each of you, and I assume that we would just take this in the order in which you were introduced, would you each briefly in two or three minutes describe the work you do with your organization and how your collaboration with the Parsons Field Institute relates to your research interests? So, Chally? Yeah, so um, as Doug said, I run the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance. And um, so the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance is a convener of partner organizations to tackle large scale projects focused on um, conservation and ecosystem restoration and a lot of other things under that umbrella um, within the larger Maricopa County area. Um, and the McDowell Sonora Conservancy is not only a critical partner for us, but is actually one of our steering committee members and helps guide um, our direction and also our um, working groups, particularly the Desert Defenders, as you heard, um, was talked about in the prior presentation. And we have um, Mary Festigi sit on our Sonoran Seed Collaborative and um, in our der urban desert scape restoration group where we are focusing on reaching out to neighborhoods to try to increase desert ecosystems and help people remove turf and save water um, in the effort to help then lead out to the preserves so we have less of a hard boundary and help also remove some of those invasive species. Um, and sorry, I have a note. And uh, the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy was also critical for developing our regional open space strategy, which is our guidance document and contains our four main goals of Protect and Connect, um, which is all about protecting habitat and migration corridors, which they are also helping with developing a future work group. Um, I've been speaking with Jesse about a project there and then also about future work. Um, Sustain and Restore, which is where Desert Defenders falls under. Love and Support, which is all about education and outreach. And Coordinate and Elevate, which is all about working together to further our reach and impact. Thank you very much, Shelley. Kathy. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, as you mentioned, I work for Bat Conservation International, um, but I'm based in Tucson where I help um, facilitate and coordinate participation throughout the Southwest, uh, mainly Arizona and New Mexico in the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Um, this is a, a multi-agency, multinational long-term monitoring program um, with a goal to assess the status and trends of North American bats. Um, and so this is a program that tries to improve the state of conservation science for bats through standardized protocols, a unified sampling design, and integrated data analysis, 
And so people all over the continent are collecting data on bat population dynamics and bat occupancy um, in order to create regular um, status and trends of North American bats. Um, the Southwest Hub was established in 2001 um, with a mission to support this monitoring through collaboration and partnerships. Um, and McDowell Snoring Conservancy is one of um, our favorite partners. I've been working with Debbie and Jesse for the last couple of years to facilitate um, your participation in this program. Um, and the program not only helps collect data and manage a database to do large scale analyses of bat species ranges, but also helps um, folks manage and conserve bats where they are living and working as well. And so because um, bat acoustic data is relatively easy to collect, but relatively difficult to process and analyze, um, we have a program where we lend out equipment and process data for our partners, such as yourselves, and create, um, upload that data into the database and create informing, informative um, reports to help, help you understand and know what um, species of bats are found um, on your property. Thank you, Kathy. So Seth, what can you tell us about the US Geological Survey take on our activities today? Yeah, thank you, Doug, and, and thank you for the invitation to talk to you all today. Um, so yeah, I, I work for the Department of the Interior, um, and so USGS is the science branch um, providing science to National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, Bureau of Land Management, and, and others. But uh, in that other category, we do a lot of work with our uh, non-Department of Interior uh, partners that are after similar goals. And so the conservancy works to really conserve and enhance the biodiversity and, and production of the Sonoran Desert ecosystem. And that's, you know, what of, a lot of our land management partners are interested in, in doing that as well. <clears throat> so through uh, interaction with Dr. Helen Rowe, who you've heard from today, uh, I found out about several restoration projects that the Conservancy was engaged in. <clears throat> At the time, we were developing uh, RestoreNet, um, which is a, basically, it's a, a systematic way of testing different restoration techniques across a number of sites. So we have about 30 sites across the Southwest, uh, including in the Chihuahuan Desert, Mojave Desert, uh, and the Colorado Plateau. Of course, your site um, at the Conservancy is uh, in the Sonoran Desert. And really the goal here is to come up with uh, best strategies to recover degraded areas. Um, so our site at the Conservancy is at the Granite Mountain Trailhead where there's been a lot of heavy recreational use. Um, maybe some of you have participated in the data collection. Um, we rely a lot on you all and our partners because we have 30 sites. We can't do it all ourselves. Um, and we use that information to come up with best practices that uh, can be put forward to use in other areas. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Seth. And Aaron, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start out with just a little bit of background on the USA National Phenology Network, which is based here at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, so the USA NPN was established back in 2007 because there wasn't really a standardized way to collect information about phenology. Um, and phenology has many different applications. We can use it to understand aspects of ecology, things like mismatch between plants and pollinators. It's also useful in um, working on invasive species, knowing the best time to treat. Um, and even things like recreation, knowing about, you know, when to tell people to go out and look for wildflowers. Um, so we created the NPN to be the standardized way of collecting data. 
And we set up the Nature's Notebook platform, which is the way that we do that data collection. Um, but it does require on crowdsourcing that kind of data collection. So we have kind of two kinds of observers. We have what we call our backyard observers and then our local phenology program observers. And so the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy was one of the early adopters of our local phenology program model. Um, we're really trying to empower groups like yours to answer your own questions that you might have about phenology. So trying to understand, you know, local species changes, whether climate change might be impacting the species that you care about, um, whether, you know, connections between two different species might be shifting. Um, so I can say that the, the data set that you all have collected is um, really amazing. It's you know, one of our long-term data sets. You have eight years of data collection now at the same sites, uh, which is really valuable. You know, tracking the same plants over time can really help us understand um, the differences between how species might react to different um, weather situations. So whether it's been a really wet winter, does that impact what's happening with the phenology in the spring? Um, does the, the increase in temperatures have an impact? So the, the information that you're collecting year after year is really important for helping us understand that. Um, and there's also connections to some um, kind of research-driven questions that you all are helping to answer as well. Um, there's connections to work we're doing with the lesser long-nosed bat, helping to understand by tracking saguaro, you know, when flowering might be available, nectar might be available for bats. Um, also other pollinators like white winged doves, you're collecting data on both white winged doves and saguaro flowering, which is a really great way to understand the connection between those two species. Um, and then just generally understanding information about Southwest phenology is really valuable as well. Um, it's kind of strange what happens here with, you know, you get a little bit of rainfall and then things start leaping out or blooming. It's really different than in other parts of the country where we're working. So it's really valuable to have that data set of um, Southwest phenology. Thank you very much. And Ron, we'd like to hear from you. You're Ron, you're mute, you're mute, you're mute, muted at the moment. No, we can't hear you, Ron. Now you should be able to well, hear. Yep. Okay, um, well, as we've seen today, one of the missions and goals of the uh, McDowell Sonoran Conservancy and the Parson Field Institute is the scientific gathering, scientific information about the resources, the biological resources on the, and geological and other resources on the preserve. And of course, it's impossible to build something really large enough to do all that uh, with, the, with the resources available. So reasonably the the conservancy reaches out to other organizations with which to partner to gain expertise and i represent a huge institution which is asu which has a huge array of uh, a huge variety of expertise and uh, a lot of people willing to do it and, and a lot of interest in in doing is what the asu mission statement says enhancing our local impact and social embeddedness so it's at the junction of those sort of two goals that that the that the partnership of ASU and the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy arises, and it's played out in a whole variety of ways. At the top end, um, one of our vice presidents, Peter Schlosser, who's a, a professor uh, in the School of Sustainability in the College of Global Futures, is on the board of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy and provides ASU perspective and involvement with the community through those activities. Uh, the Conservancy has also provided a lot of learning opportunities for a number of ASU undergraduate and graduate students. We saw that today with uh, Bradley's presentation on the analysis that's ongoing of the butterflies. And, uh, and also there are a large number of faculty and staff who at ASU who uh, buy into this idea of enhancing our local impact and societal embeddedness and are keen to offer their expertise um, in a variety of contexts. So Jennifer Broach, we saw that Bradley came has come out of her lab out at ASU West. I know that uh, uh, Heather Bateman, another faculty member have been in, in, involved with the uh, 
with the McDowell Sonoran Preserve and the Field Institute in a large number of ways doing research on restoration, monitoring, all the stuff we've been hearing about today. Just for a minute to speak about my how, what I've been involved with, I initially partnered with, as a faculty member at ASU with the Conservancy in 2011 uh, to do a to help with a study of documenting the diversity of large day flying insects on the preserve. That went on for about three years. It was sort of an outgrowth of my research program on insect mating systems, where population biology becomes an important determinant of the particular mating system structure that we find in a species. After about three years, the emphasis changed from assessing the biodiversity on the preserve, as we've heard today, to monitoring the populations that are there for both management and, as I always say, educational purposes as well. I'd been involved with butterfly counts in central Arizona since 2007, so I became a sort of scientific advisor and participant in butterfly counts that the uh, Parson Field Institute uh, uh, wanted to run as part of their monitoring program. The first fall count was run in 2014 and has now gone on for nine years. In 2017, the pros program was expanded to include spring counts. And uh, so that's been going on now for about seven years. And we've learned a lot about how butterfly abundance and diversity um, on the preserve changes over time. Uh, and But we continue to learn more with each passing count. And uh, we've heard something about some of the results today from Bad Bradley. So I've, you know, it hasn't been a direct outgrowth of my research program, but it's been a set of opportunities and experiences that I've, uh, that have grown out of my partnership and ASU's partnership with the conservatives to see that I've, I've greatly valued. Thank you, Ron. And Vicki, we enjoy hearing from you. Well, I'm the wildlife biologist for Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Um, as you, uh, as Doug said, I've been in my position for about two years, and my one of my key goals for the position is to inventory all wildlife that occurs within the tribal boundaries, which is not a small undertaking. Um, and I am just one person. In my time uh, with the community, uh, I've started avian surveys and things of that sort, and we're moving forward. Um, and one of the biggest things that I've you know, gained from uh, McDowell Sonora Conservancy is actually being able to pick Mary and Jesse's brains um, uh, because they've helped me kind of come up like aware of some of the research they've done and, and use that in, in my planning for how I'm going to be inventorying 52,000 acres of, of uh, land um, as I continue my process. All right. Thank you very much. Well, we have approximately 15 to 20 minutes to entertain questions. Lars is on top of our chat room. Do we have questions, Lars, that have been posed? I don't see any quite yet. So everyone, okay. please feel free. Well, Vicki, your work with the Native American community in the local area is fascinating. Could you tell us a little about their major wildlife concerns? within that community? Well, one of the major things is we don't know what we have, so we can't really make any decisions on what we need or what is major concerns, other than, of course, anything that is tribally significant would have major concerns for ensuring that the habitat maintains. Um, as with everywhere in the valley, you have concerns about uh, invasive species, because I'm also the invasive species biologist for the tribe. Um, so I'm, I'm wearing a, quite a few hats, so we're, focused on removing, you know, salt cedar. And um, we've recently put out a, a pamphlet within the community for stink net removal um, to help the community kind of control that. At least community members in their own yards can start to control that as we plan to expand our efforts to areas that are already disturbed and already covered in stink net. And then, um, so we started avian surveys and we've been keeping an eye on what kind of avian species we have. But as Anybody who works with wildlife knows you can't really just decide on one year what you need to be doing for the future. Um, it takes a few years of baseline data to really make a decision on on what we need to be restoring or what we need to be paying attention to. Uh, so 
we do some river restoration. We do some some um, invasive species removals, and we focus on that as of now. Well, thank you very much. And Kathy, your work with bats, bats, as everyone knows, have very much been in the news in the past few days. And I'm wondering what you view as the most important implications of your research going sure. into the future. Um, so we are here in Arizona are in really the hot spot of bat diversity in the United States. And yet we have very little um, long-term data on what species of bats are found where. We have 28 species of bats um, in Arizona, which is a lot, but we really don't know much about their seasonality, um, their ranges. Um, and we need that baseline information to say, um, know how white nose syndrome is gonna impact them, to know how wind energy is gonna impact them. We do have a migratory species here, um, as well as climate change and, and other um, impacts to bats. And so a lot of what we're doing is, is doing sort of a large scale assessment of just knowing who is found where. And so just getting these, um, getting these inventories now that we have the technology developed to get inventories of bat um, diversity all throughout different habitats, different spatial locations is really um, a major innovation for a species that, for a, sorry, a group of species that are um, historically, we just know very little about their ecology and distribution. And so um, one thing I didn't mention is, um, the, the reason acoustic surveying of bats is really cool and really useful is that because individual species of bats have very distinct echolocation calls. And so what we're doing when we're making these acoustic um, surveys is we're able to determine what species are present in an area by, um, by looking at sort of the shape of their calls, the frequency of their calls, the nature of their calls. So it's, there's some really neat sort of recent technology that's made this feasible. All right, thank you. Uh, we are starting to get a couple questions if you want me to. Wonderful, go okay. ahead with those, Lars. So uh, this is actually to the panel, so any everyone to, can respond, but it's, uh, besides invasives, what does the panel see as major opportunities for regional collaborative efforts, studies, et cetera? Anyone want to go first? Get there. I can go first. Um, so I would say that there's a lot of opportunities, but some of the biggest ones aside from invasives are protecting these habitat areas and, um, you know, gathering this data at the same time. And a lot of the work that McDowell Center and Conservancy is doing is great work, and we can take that and help other groups to kind of extrapolate lessons learned and to spread it around not only the valley, but, you know, different parts of Arizona so we can start working on this as a whole ecosystem. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wanted to contribute on that one? I can share a, a project that we've been working on with the Conservancy Local Phenology Program. Um, so we we have um, many different local phrenology programs across the country. Um, we have over 200 that participate every year. And a lot of times there's a limited capacity to actually sit down and look at the data that they have so far. You know, they often have questions that they're trying to answer, but it's just hard to get to the point of being able to answer those questions, even if they have a great long-term data set. So we started last year a process to try to empower our local phonology programs to answer their own questions with um, data analysis guidance. So we've been working with several members of the Conservancy to look at what they have so far and figure out, you know, what are the questions that you're trying to answer? And then it's really helped kind of inform the process that we're creating this year to put together a series of um, learning modules online that will help them to actually go through that, that process of figuring out um, what test should I run? How do I interpret the results and then um, write those up into summaries? So it's an exciting project and we really value the input from this group because that'll end up 
helping with all these other groups across the country that are trying to do the same thing. Awesome, thank you, Aaron. I have, one, I have one thing I, I would like to contribute, which is that it'd be interesting, uh, the monitoring programs across the preserve and in, in uh, connection with the other groups that are represented here to, to, to uh, integrate across the monitoring programs. Like one, at least being interested in butterflies, I always thought would be interesting if, if there could somehow be more integrated activity or or a comparison of data sets between the plant phenology program and the butterflies, because the butterflies obviously rely on the on the plants. Uh, similarly, the the ground nest, the ground dwelling arthropods. You know, the, are there are there arthropods like the butterflies. Are we seeing similar sorts of variation in abundance and diversity um, with precipitation, like we're finding in the butterflies? So. Some just looking across from the mon different monitoring programs, I think would be really interesting and productive. I'm going to mention something that's more of the near future because wildlife corridors are kind of a major thing at this point. Um, you know, all the grants are going out, and that's one of the things that the monitoring program that that uh, um, is going on at, at McDowell Sonoran Preserve uh, helps with because you have you know, the McDowell Mountains right there, and you have tribal lands close by that also have preserved lands. So that's a good connection and corridor kind of research that can can continue into the future. And it can, can also connect all the way down into the Tonto, which is, you know, way far, but actually pretty regionally wide scale. And when you're looking at that in the grand scheme of, of wildlife movement. Awesome. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, I can move on unless anyone has anyone else to contribute on that one. Uh, one another one was, um, I'm not sure of the specifics on this, but it's uh, what data gaps do the panelists see that the uh, Conservancy can contribute to going into the future? If there's any ideas that you've seen out of today's presentations. All right. I'm not sure if that if that person wants to maybe get a little bit more specific, that would be great. But uh, the next one is, uh, what are the key elements of practical monitoring into the future, uh, given limited resources and the need uh, to translate monitoring into action when possible? Can you oh, repeat I think... that? Oh, oh, go ahead and repeat it, Lars. Okay, it's uh, it's what are the key elements of practical monitoring into the future, uh, given limited resources and the need to translate monitoring into action when possible? I'll piggyback a thought on that. As citizen scientists, our work might be relevant to this question. I'm wondering to what extent citizen scientists and other volunteers have proved fundamental to the work you're doing. Well, of course, that's completely true, as you well know, Doug, for the butterfly counts. I mean, and that's one of the the the, the fantastic uh, stewards and the training programs and all of that make these butterfly counts done the way we do them uh, possible. <laughs> it's 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 a critical element to the success of the the butterfly monitoring program. I would say um, what you are doing already by partnering with other organizations that maybe have capacity that you don't say like the NPN or any that, or, you know, I think we heard about quite a few who can um, take your data and translate it into products that are, and put it in the context of other data is really valuable rather than collecting data with, you know, a unique set of protocols that might not um, translate or be able to be combined with other data sets. I think that's a really great thing that's already happening. I, I also would like to jump in and say that, um, you know, the community scientists are absolutely integral to programs like the Desert Defenders. It wouldn't function 
anywhere near as well as it does without people like the stewards at the Conservancy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any additional, Doug, if you got a couple other questions. Well, I, I'm curious, Seth, regarding your work. We've had some preliminary results through our degraded lands studies here in the preserve. I'm wondering on a broad scale, if you're seeing significant trends in restoration research as to what might work best throughout the West? Yeah, that's a great question. And just to piggyback on the last question, I mean, a lot of the power in doing this and your involvement is that it, it has a regional uh, significance. And so because it's a network, we can kind of pinpoint, you know, where restoration strategies work and, and where they don't. Um, and so I, I, I think it's, you know, absolutely essential to have partners like you uh, involved in this work. Um, with respect to patterns, we're seeing more broadly um, these small uh, pits or depressions um, is really a borrowed technique from uh, Native American culture, Zuni waffle gardens and, and other tribes, where if you just create this small depression, you can retain uh, water and it really across the board bolsters germination success and seedling success. Um, so that's one of the strategies we saw that that just across the board is is a great technique. Um, and other things are more nuanced. Um, some things require, or some sites required a certain you know seed mix to take off, uh, or responded more to some of the other treatments we're doing. So again, contributing to this is is really helping us understand what works across really the whole Southwest. Um, there's a lot of places we don't have information, but uh, we really appreciate um, the fact that this uh, project involves uh, partners like you that can help us collect data. Well, I have one last question, Aaron, that I would like to pose to you and your work with phenology. I'm wondering what phenological associations are you finding to be of most interest and most significance in the Southwest? Are you noticing patterns that we should be concerned about or that are most notable? Yeah, so we um, we are really interested in what's happening with um, keystone species like saguaros. Um, you all probably have recognized that the flowering just in the last couple of years has been really variable. You know, we had a really low bloom year last year. This year seems like it's really great. There's a lot of flowers and, and that was the same thing two years ago. So there's a lot of variability that happens. So having a long-term data set where like you all are collecting where you have the same saguaro or multiple saguaros and you're looking at those same plants year after year, that really helps us to understand what's going on with those plants. Um, we're also really interested in the impact of drought as well and looking at you, know, you have a, a diversity of species that you're tracking from cactus to um, mesquites and some shrubs as well. And being able to look at that over the long term is, is really useful as well. Um, and because you're collecting data through the standardized protocol that we have in Nature's Notebook, it allows us to also compare data to other parts of the state and even beyond. So being able to see what's going on at, at your locations versus others is, is really valuable as well. Oh, thank you. Well, I just want to express my appreciation to you and your organizations for the work you're doing and for the opportunity for us as the Field Institute and citizen scientists to collaborate with you. We have entered into a Living Labs relationship uh, with high schools in Scottsdale and we're, uh, Claire Musser is going to lead a discussion now about our educational programs in the Conservancy. Claire, you're Claire. muted. Okay. Claire, you're still muted. muted. 
So the leaf blower is right outside my window. Is that okay? I yeah. can't hear it. Oh, can you hear? It? Yeah, okay. The leaf blower has just gone past, so I can make a start. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. All right, so I will begin. So, yeah, we've heard today there's some amazing scientific research that's happening at the Conservancy. And often with scientific research, there can be a long delay from the time the research is conducted to when the research is made available to the public, with most research limited to academic journals and conferences. Publishing peer review and rigorous research does take time, but there is value in translating this research for a wider audience and sharing the research process and the reasons why the research was being conducted in the first place. So as an educator, I've made a career of translating scientific research into memorable and interactive learning experiences for students from kindergarten through to high school, college and adults. So with a background in the arts, education and social sciences, I have seen how bringing science to life can excite learners. So today I'd like to share how through the Sonoran Education Centre, we're creating engaging educational experiences that are based on our scientific research. So the Sonoran Education Centre is also home to our adult education curriculum and the content development team, which provides support to stewards looking to create educational presentations and experiences for diverse audiences. So I'll start with our youngest audience, the students we teach through our youth education programme. So before I want to begin, I just want to first explain a little bit about what makes our youth, sorry, our youth education programme so successful. So you may have heard of STEAM education, so that's science, technology, engineering and math, but we take it one step further and we add the arts to make STEAM education. So while scientific research is inherently valuable, sometimes it takes a little extra creativity to engage a middle school student. By incorporating the arts, we can inspire students with very diverse interests and engage them in science and understanding how science can be explored across different subject areas. So this is a useful skill in communicating our message to multiple audiences and generations. So we currently visit classrooms and we take part in community events and we bring students out on field trips to the preserve. And so far, we've engaged over 6,000 students through these hands-on interactive and inquiry-led collaborative STEAM educational programmes. And they also meet AZ academic standards across multiple subject areas. So how do we do this? So we start by establishing our expectations with students. At every grade level, we address our students as scientists. We can then track their scientific journey by thinking about our educational offerings on a spiral. This allows us to map the student progression and when we can intentionally revisit topics throughout the grade levels. As you can see, our scientific research on the right is paired with the student activities shown on the left. So we begin our spiral with our expedition days program that takes place in the classroom and then as a field trip to the preserve. I'll talk a little bit more about these programs in a moment. And we also have our Bahada Explorers program where students visit the preserve and collect data. These data collection skills are then developed further during the Living Labs High School program where students manage their own scientific project. So I won't talk too much about that today because we're lucky enough to have the students here to tell us all about their project. And in the future, we're also looking at paid internships, which will help create career pathways for underserved students and show that careers in science are possible for all. So um, STEAM education alone, though, is not going to encourage students to care about the Sonoran Desert. We live in a world where many have lost their connection to nature. We have environmental destruction and species extinction happening all around us. So as a social scientist, I just want to draw your attention to E.O. Wilson's biophilia hypothesis. So biophilia is derived from the Greek word and its literal translation is love of life. So as humans, we have an innate love of the natural world. And to reignite this sense of biophilia in students, we need to look beyond teaching only the science and also include fostering emotional connection with both the landscape and the animals that live there. So what research do we focus on? As environmental educators, we're always looking for interesting topics and research that we can translate into programmes. We've seen amazing research happening in the preserve, and this has allowed us to find our niche. We can offer programmes that are not only unique to the Conservancy, but also bring students closer to understanding their place in the Sonoran Desert. 
I use our third and fourth grade in-person expedition days programs as an example. This season alone, we've engaged over 3,000 students for these activities. So this is a really good place to start. The areas we focus on here are biodiversity protection, invasive plant mitigation and ecological restoration. So we've heard today about the complexity of this research, but there are still ways to simplify these overarching concepts and make them accessible for third and fourth graders. We want students to leave our programmes not only with an awareness of the research, but also the reasons behind it. This ultimately gives students a clear call to action, a sense of empowerment, so they can see the small changes are relevant to their lives. So our biodiversity protection work is highlighted in our third, and four, um, our third grade hidden desert and ecosystem Jenga activities. In ecosystem Jenga, students are given blocks labelled with animal names so that they can take ownership of a species that lives in the Sonoran Desert. We then talk about the biodiversity of the Sonoran Desert and the connections between species and the food web. As the dice is rolled and the blocks are removed, students see the delicate balance. All along, we're reinforcing the need for biodiversity protection and exploring the role that humans can play in protecting this unique ecosystem. As the Jenga blocks fall, we are modelling how this ecosystem can collapse. And it's here that students share their calls to action and look for ways to protect our environment. We can then look at our camera trapping research to understand how we can find evidence of the different animals, even when we don't always get to see them. The trail camera images are a great way to show how we can view wildlife and learn that we can get to see so much more by passively viewing wildlife. But then how do we know where the animals are going to be? Students also play scat bingo to expand their knowledge of the food web and learn how to identify different animals by looking at their scat. Later, they use a ruler and their field guide to figure out which animal is most likely to live in each of the desert holes. But the activity isn't complete unless students get to take home a piece of their scientific research. Each student has the chance to print their choice of animal track and label their drawing with the species, writing their name on their work in the space that says scientist. By the end of these activities, students understand the importance of biodiversity protection. And they tell us how, as third graders, they can protect the ecosystem, with one of the most simple calls to action for them being staying on the trail. So then we continue the theme of biodiversity at fourth grade. We use our trail camera images of bobcats and mountain lions to introduce the theme of human wildlife, conflict and coexistence. Here, students build on what they have learned about biodiversity and start to use more critical thinking skills to understand about the challenges that wildlife face. In mountain lion Tetris, students take on the role of two mountain lions searching for a new territory. We discuss habitat fragmentation and the need for connected habitats. They have not only to look for resources, so this is food, water, shelter and space, but also avoid traffic, houses, hikers and bikers. Next, they find themselves as a bobcat mother trying to find a way to move her kittens back to the preserve, navigating a busy road, buses and dog walkers. Both these activities ask students to imagine what it's like to be a wild feline living on the fringes of a human dominated landscape. This activity builds both compassion and empathy for our wild neighbours and students leave with a better understanding of the challenges that wildlife face and why we need to protect open spaces like the Scottsdale McDowell Sonora Preserve. So we also share our work in invasive plant mitigation and ecological restoration. At fourth grade, we focus on problems caused by both buffer grass and fountain grass. Data collection and graphing may not sound like something a fourth grader would like to do, but when we combine storytelling and kinesthetic learning, students are able to enhance their brain's capacity to retain information. We introduce the activity by taking a closer look at both um, spe these species using scientific observational skills and trying to tell the difference between the um, buffer grass and the fountain grass. During the activity, students are given ownership of an indigenous plant which enhances their connection to nature. Students then take part in a math activity where they see how buffer grass can outcompete our desert plants, then turning their data into a graph to show the growth. We then learn about the ways that plants have been introduced to a new area and the problems that invasive plants can cause for our indigenous plants. Students then continue their scientific exploration by drawing the buffer grass or the fountain grass and hypothesizing why it can be so easily spread. These drawings are also something they get to take home and share with their friends and family, another great way that we can share our research. 
We then finish the activities by modelling how buffer grass seeds can disperse. We use large felt seeds to throw the hiking boots on the dog, understanding how easily it could stick. The students experiment with the amount of seeds they throw at a time, the speed, the direction of the throw, and at what point they all fall to the ground. By the end of this activity, students are able to share their thoughts and they will tell us that we need to stay on the trail and keep the dogs on a leash. While we encourage students to be observant, we also make sure they're aware of their limitations. They learn that they are still learning. They are scientists in training. Going home and putting up any plant that could maybe be an invasive species is not an appropriate call, of, um, call for action for a fourth grader. So we also continue the theme by exploring ecological restoration in our watersheds activity. They learn from our scientific research. We show them images of our habitat restoration projects and they learn that where land is disturbed and, de and degraded, it can't support life. Again, we use scientific modelling where the students draw out their cities and landscapes actually on these plaster mountains, combining science with engineering as they predict where their water will flow. Um, when their drawings are complete, we test their hypothesis. We spray their models with water, looking at how and where the water flows across the model and to see in which area their cities can survive. Not only do students learn the importance of the preserve and habitat restoration, they also learn about city planning and they can see the effects of damaged habitats. And like all our activities, it ends with a clear call to action to help keep our environment free of pollutants and learning to conserve water. So we tell students all the time that they can be scientists. So let's make sure we teach them using actual scientific research. Using actual research and data is exciting. It connects them to the real world and is applicable to their lived experiences. And we can see how empowering students allows them to make positive changes towards the conservation of the Sonoran Desert. Let's also prepare students for the future. We need to increase scientific and environmental literacy in all students. By thinking creatively and using the science within STEAM, we allow for student choice. We encourage learners and we help students develop critical thinking skills. And this is the best way to prepare them for careers which may not even exist yet. So I've talked a lot about our youth education programmes, but before I close out, I just want to take a moment again to highlight our adult educational curriculum. This curriculum guides the content development team when working with stewards who would like to develop more adult educational content across our programmes, from community engagement, guided hike and bike, and of course, citizen science. In adult education, we um, work on the ideas that everything is connected and always changing. And many of the ideas I've discussed in youth education can be found within our adult um, education curriculum. So we encourage presenters to explore scientific processes, make connections across domains and explore relationships between humans and the environment, with each presentation having their own unique call to action. Some of these new presentations have already been presented as part of the Mustang Library series, and I encourage you all to take a look. So we are also working closely with citizen science to translate our research to wider audiences, and we look forward to sharing this content with you um, over the next season or so. So yeah, that is a little bit about what I have for you today. So I'm not sure how long, <laughs> how long that took, but um, if anybody has any questions, I can, um, maybe you could let me know if there's any in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any questions yet. Okay, so I'm on, I'm on multiple screens as well and paranoid about the, uh, <laughs> the leaf blower. But I know we're going to hear from our amazing um, eco club next. So all of the things that we talk about in youth education all comes together within um, our Living Labs project. And we really look at how we can make those connections. And we think about the impact that this project has on the lives of the students and of course the environment as well. Oh, and here's Scott. Here's Scott right now. So I think we are on time so I can, pass you over to Scott if you would like. Sure, thank you, Claire. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us this afternoon. Um, as Claire mentioned, we are the Saguaro Environmental Club. I'm here with several students from the Environmental Club, and we are gonna talk to you today about the Living Labs project that we've been working very closely with the McDowell Conservancy on. Give me just a moment to share my screen. Thanks. 
Can everybody see this? Let me make this full screen. Okay, so what you see on my screen here is um, this GIS story map that our students have put together. And the purpose of us putting this presentation together in this manner, rather than a regular PowerPoint presentation, like what these students may normally do, is so that they could create a living document to be used as a template for other schools, hopefully within the district, but also in other parts of the state to use this as a template. So uh, first quickly, we wanna say thank you to the Conservancy for having us and for inviting us and for allowing us to work closely with them on this project. Um, over the next 20 minutes or so, you'll hear from five students that I have here from the Saguaro Environmental Club about the massive project that they've been working on this year with multiple community partners, including the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, researchers at Northern Arizona University, community members from the Scottsdale Leadership Group, um, and faculty at the at Scottsdale Community College. All of that culminated in these students working very hard for many, many months to create the first ever living laboratory on our high school campus and the first one to exist in our district, but hopefully not the last. So the first experience to start this off, as Claire mentioned um, a lot about, was actually a field trip to the, to the McDowell Sonoran Preserve, as you can see here where the students had an opportunity to engage um, in all kinds of activities from staff scientists at the preserve and uh, stewards at the preserve who took students around the native Sonoran habitat and allowed students to interact with what they were seeing in the environment around them. Um, as you can see in these pictures, that experience included students interacting with ongoing biocrust and restoration research projects, collecting uh, seek and I naturalist biodiversity data, learning about soil infiltration tests and how to collect that data, and just overall practicing observations of the natural world, um, which included nature journaling and also sketching their observations in, in their personal journals, which you will hear some about in just a little bit. So this is just a quick snapshot of some of the activities that these students had an opportunity to do, but definitely not everything that we were able to be involved in at the Conservancy. Um, over the next few months, once we returned back to our high school campus, the students were quickly involved in a whirlwind of projects, uh, trying to incorporate these different experiences from the preserve into things that we could do on campus. So here in these two pictures, you see a small group of our environmental club students performing the first soil infiltration tests on our soon to be saguaro nurse condition plots, which you'll hear about soon. Um, and after they did these soil infiltration tests, they quickly ran with everything that they learned from the Conservancy, including taking a biodiversity index of our campus and quickly removing invasive species, which you will also hear about soon from a couple of our club officers. So before I turn it over to the students, because this is really who that is all about, I wanted to just quickly give an overview uh, of the three major components of our project this year that we worked closely with the Conservancy on, as well as many other community members. So our project had um, three major components, which involved removing invasive grasses and planting a native pollinator garden, designing a vertical biocrust garden, and designing and planting a saguaro research plot, which included 40 saguaro cactus, nurse plants, and different nurse conditions for a controlled research experiment, which was um, in close collaboration with NAU and the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. The students that I have with me today will talk in much more detail about those projects. Um, but before I turn it over to them, just quickly so that everybody knows the purpose of this project, the overall goal is for us to provide a campus ecosystem that is sustainable and can be used as more than just a garden, but as a laboratory um, to be incorporated into curriculum, not only in science classes, but also in classes across the, the school uh, ecosystem itself. So in doing this, students have had an opportunity to engage each other in loving the natural world and learning how to collect data, but also um, have had an opportunity to, to learn about themselves and why they're interested in science in the first place. So I have five students here with me today from the club. I wanna just quickly introduce them and they're gonna do most of this presentation. The first couple that I have to introduce to you are, are uh, two of our officers, Claire Holtry and Sadie Williams, and then they will be turning it over to Nikhil Sethi, um, who will be presenting a section that was done with another officer of ours, Kate Dalton, who unfortunately could not be here, be here. And then they will transition to our final two, 
um, Giovanna Raboyne and Marco Bartoletti. So without further ado, I will pass this off to Claire Holtry and Sadie Williams, who will present the first aspect of our project. Claire and Sadie, here you go. Thank you, Mr. Milne, for that amazing introduction. I'm Claire. I'm Sadie. And as he stated, there are many components that make up the empire that is the Living Labs project. Um, we are about to touch on the pollinator garden, which is one of the three of these components. Um, so we would love to elaborate on this project and how it came to be. So in the initial stages of this project, we used um, the app Seek and iNaturalist to kind of get a general idea of the biodiversity that existed on our campus at the time. Um, unfortunately, we realized that that biodiversity was extremely lacking. And although this saddened us, it also gave us hope for the future of our project and it gave us ideas and optimism. So the first thing that we did was collect initial data of our campus. So we split our campus into eight similarly sized study areas and pairs of students walked each area and collected the data on all of the species that they observed. Initially, as Claire mentioned, we didn't observe much biodiversity on campus, but since planting our pollinator garden, we have observed noticeably more species on our campus. Now in this initial project, sorry, um, in this initial process, we did collect, um, we did write down some of our observations and um, journal entries, as Mr. Milne mentioned. Um, and these journal entries are only glimpses into our minds in the initial stages of this project. Um, as you can see, we are we're optimistic stepping into this project and evidently it did pay off as um, we channeled our hope into hard work, which is how Living Labs came to be. Throughout this process, we also learned about some plant adaptations that are made in the desert biome. Here are just a few examples that plants make in the desert. And if you'd like to learn more, we've included a link in this box. Now, given this is the pollinator pathway garden, um, we did learn about the important association of pollinators with the native species that we planted. Um, these are some snapshots of us planting these native species. And we really did just learn the value of teamwork in this process. As you can see, we really did make a day out of each of our planting sessions and we overall grew closer as a club. And when we began, well, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. when we first started the um, hands-on implementation of our garden, we first had to start with removing the invasive fountain grass that plagued our campus. I'm sure as everyone here is aware, uh, fountain grass is invasive to our Arizona, um, wildlife and it does not promote the biodiversity that we were looking for, therefore it had to go. Um, and as you are all aware, these plants are extremely heavy and overall massive. And so it really did take a village to remove each one, um, but we use the power of teamwork to ultimately get them out of the ground and replace them with new native species. It was very fun overall. So here are some more journal entries that we wrote from the removal of the fountain grass. It was really amazing to get such a hands-on experience and to be able to take part in moving towards our ultimate goal. And here are a few more photos of the um, plant removal and planting process. You can see us doing uh, the labor intensive work right here, but what matters is that we were doing it together. Um, we had a lot of fun, as you can see, some silly moments riding around on um, Mr. Milne's tractor and uh, carrying the fountain grass to an alternate destination. And then here's us planting the very first native species in our pollinator garden. This was such an, a surreal moment of finally all of our hard work paying off. And when we implemented this pollinator pathway garden, we did, um, well, um, Kate Dalton, who couldn't be here with us today, did make this amazing graph um, kind of showcasing and organizing the um, various species that we hold in this garden in a very color-coded and organized manner. So in our garden, we have a couple annual plants. This includes the lupin, which attracts bees, the skeleton weed, which attracts butterflies, and then the deer vetch, which attracts hummingbirds. And those are just a few examples of the plants that we have in our garden. And here we have some photos of our um, some of the various wildlife that we have in our garden in bloom. Um, this desert marigold, for example, started off as just a minuscule little flower, but as you can see, it's uh, just beautifully blossomed and it's just been beyond rewarding to actually see visually the results. 
And we came to the conclusion that our overall goal through this pollinator garden is not only to attract various species of wildlife and to increase our biodiversity on campus, but also to create that vital connection between the community and wildlife that is so important in any restoration project. And finally, we'd like to share with you some of the pollinators that we have seen on our campus since the planting of native pollinator species. It's been so cool to be able to already see the changes in biodiversity on our campus. And we've also included this hummingbird and honeybee sound that you're now able to hear in our garden. Now, as previously mentioned, the pollinator garden is only one of three components that make up the Living Labs project, and I will turn it over to Nikhil Sethi to elaborate on the second portion of our project. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Nikhil, and I am going to be sharing with you about the Swaro Nurse Condition Experiment that is a major component of our Living Labs project. Uh, and I did just want to say thank you to Kate Dalton, who is not with us today because she's not feeling well, uh, but she contributed greatly to this presentation. And we are very grateful for her. So uh, the way that this project kind of got in the ground was uh, thanks to the Conservancy who shared with us this idea of nurse plants and nurse conditions. For us, this was a relatively new subject, but we found it to be very important, interesting, and compelling, especially because of its great focus on conserving important species like the saguaro cactus, uh, which is a keystone species, as I mentioned, and provides great benefit to the different plant and animal uh, surroundings in the desert, which I heard was mentioned earlier in the symposium, but we were very excited because we were able to be take a hand in conserving saguaros. So, we were instantly excited about this project and we decided to do some research into our nurse plants, nurse rocks, and nurse shade conditions to find what the possible benefits of including them and researching them would be. So we discovered uh, that the existing research on nurse plants has shown that they are able to help saguaros uh, against outside factors that may be of harm to them, such as human impact and excess heat, as well as helping to lock in moisture for saguaros. So we were excited that all these conditions may be able to affect, positively affect the growth of these saguaros, and we were really ready to get started. So after some meetings with the Sonoran Conservancy and also with Scottsdale Community College, we got started on actually breaking ground, ground on this planter. So this planter had not been touched in multiple years, and a lot of this project came from the idea that we wanted to uh, bring some biodiversity to our campus and re-beautify it. So this planter had been an eyesore for a couple of years with nothing really left in it. So when we came through to get started on this project, we tilled the soil and uh, we had great help from Saguaro facilities, and we were very thankful to Joe Arteca for helping us with a lot of this work. But we were able to till the soil, dig out the walls of the planter, as you can see here, and redo them just to make sure that we were safe to plant within here uh, and break some ground on this planter. And as you can see here, I know Mr. Mill mentioned this briefly earlier, but this was a big component was installing these irrigation lines, a uh, skill that we didn't necessarily foresee ourselves learning, but this was one that was of great interest to a lot of our club members and was exciting to learn more about irrigation. And this is the next step of the progress. We were able to re-level this planter and start measuring out where all of these saguaro plots were gonna be. So we were making sure that everything was controlled and consistent when we were making these plots, even and so that we can install even plots for each of the 40 saguaros that would eventually be a part of this planter. So that's the progress that we made to get to the point where we were able to actually get started on bringing in the saguaros and the nurse conditions. So with the help of Scottsdale Community College, the Scottsdale Leadership Group, uh, Dr. Rowe, who I know is with us today, Dr. Rowe from Northern Arizona University and the Sonoran Conservancy, of course, uh, we were able to make this vision a reality. So after we did this research that we were able to learn more about nurse conditions, uh, we were able to actually get started on the planting aspect. And thankfully we had Scottsdale Community College to help us and aid us and also provide us with great advice along the way uh, they provided us with our triangle leaf burr sage nurse plants, as well as our saguaros that we put into this planter. Uh, we made a another fun day, <laughs> another fun couple days, the weekend that we planted all of these saguaros and nurse plants. We had a lot of uh, 
break, uh, a lot of uh, needles stuck in our hands at the end, but it was still a really great experience. And regardless of the needles, we were super happy that we were actually able to get all these plants in the ground so that we had an operational living lab at our own school, uh, which is an idea that we had thrown up before, but we were actually excited to see it here in physical at our school. So once all of this planting was completed, I'll show you some of these images here. This is one of our experimental plots. Uh, and this shows all three nurse conditions. We have a saguaro here in the center. Uh, we have a triangle leaf bursage nurse plant and a nurse rock, which is a cinder block type material. And we have this nurse shade condition right here. And there, here's a uh, animated representation of that. And this is our saguaro planter as a whole. Uh, and as you can see, there are various assortments of different nurse conditions so that we can see how the various conditions impact their individual saguaros. And a great thing that uh, Dr. Rowe provided for us was this entire experimental design, which we were, was able to be greatly educational for each of us because we were able to see how to form a experiment in an actual laboratory, which happened to become our school. And uh, she was able to share with us how we can accurately and concisely create data points based off of this planter. So I actually got the, I actually got to meet her and discuss with her the different aspects of this project. And it was a very exciting and very informational for me and for other students. And after she shared with us all of the different uh, aspects of the saguaros that we should be measuring, we got to work measuring some of this baseline data so that over time we'll be able to expand and continue to monitor the growth of these saguaros. So as, it, as is seen in this journal entry right here, we're discussing the process of planting the saguaros. And uh, we started from pretty bare bones with just a lot of dirt, as you can see in these photos. And then we uh, were able to get all the saguaros in and planted with these cages to protect them and also provide the nurse shade conditions. Here's some more photos. And once Dr. Rowe was finished advising us on, on what we should be measuring for these saguaros and how we should go about doing them, uh, we started measuring the size, height, width, and the number of ribs and aerials on these saguaros so that over time we'll be able to see how the nurse conditions are affecting their growth and that we can hopefully yield some positive results com as compared to the nurse plots that do not have any nurse conditions or nurse plants. So we did experience a couple of roadblocks on the way to getting this data. Um, after the, uh, the weekend following the day that we planted all the saguaros, we noticed that all of our cages were uh, tossed about surrounding the planter and that there was, there was uh, clearly an issue that had occurred to cause this to happen. And we originally imagined that it was a vandal. And we were lucky and happy to realize that after looking at so security camera footage that it was just a microburst. Uh, but this was in educational for us because we know that we need to continuously monitor, monitor our plot as we had previously thought, but also that we should uh, ground staple in our cages to make sure that they don't get tossed about by the wind. And also um, after a couple of weeks being, in, being planted, uh, the nurse plants, the triangle leaf burst ages weeks uh, had experienced some dryness due to the hot Arizona sun uh, in the beginning of this hot season. So we did have to replace two or three of these burst ages just to ensure that they were living and thriving. Uh, but we did learn how to monitor for new growth and make sure that all of the burst ages are healthy uh, and consistent throughout the plots. So here's some photos of taking those initial measurements, again, of size, height, width, and more stats on each of the saguaro cacti. And this was a learning curve for us as we all had to communicate and make sure that our measurements were consistent. So after some practice, uh, we all got there and we're able to take these measurements and ensure that they're all consistent. And here's a before and after of this plot uh, with all the different saguaro plots, each one being surrounded by an individual cage right here. And now we're very excited to see how this project grows and continues. Uh, we know every month we're going to continue to collect data on this plot and see how these nurse conditions are positively affecting the growth of these saguaros. Uh, and hopefully this can be handed down through multiple generations of students as the saguaro growth cycle is a very long one. Uh, this is a project that can be maintained by generations of students to come. Uh, and to bounce off of that, we're very excited of the potential of this expanding to other schools in our district and around our state uh, so that other students can learn about the benefits of conserving different keystone species uh, and also can learn how to conduct their own lab on their campus. And we're already starting to share this with other students, uh, but we're excited to share it with even more students. So now that we have some real progress on the ground with this planter, we're super excited to see how it goes. And from that, I'm going to 
deliver the presentation to our next presenters, Gian and Marco, who are going to share with us what we've learned about Biocrust and about our vertical gardens. Thank you, Nikhil. Okay, so I am Giovanna, also known as Gian. I'm Marco, also known as Marco. So as Mr. Milne previously mentioned, we were fortunate enough to go on a field trip to the Conservancy. And there we were able to learn about a little thing called Biocrust. At first, we all thought it was just, you know, dirt, but as time went on, we, we learned what Biocrust actually is, and it sparked our curiosity to want us to learn more about it at our school. So we're going to start off with what is Biocrust? As you all know, Biocrust is like the skin of the earth. It is a community of moss, cyanobacteria, and lichen that hold the top layer of earth together. It is kind of like a band-aid. So this is a quote from one of our members when they first saw Biocrust and how at first they thought it wasn't really anything and then soon came to realize how cool it is. Something we also learned was how Biocrust benefits the environment. We learned that Biocrust helps restore areas impacted by human land destruction and that it holds down loose dirt during dust storms as well as prevents landslides, retains water, and prevents water runoff, which is very important, especially here in the desert, because we don't often get storms and a lot of our land has trouble absorb absorbing the water. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about some threats that affect biocrust. Um, so one of the main threats to biocrust is human impact, and this can come in many forms. Um, one of the main ones being uh, people going off trail. Um, when they go off trail, they can walk around and step on biocrust, which will destroy it. And that's very bad as biocrust takes decades to form. Um, another threat to biocrust um, from humans are off-road vehicles. So these can be mountain bikes, dune buggies, or motorized vehicles. Um, and just like people, they will dig up the ground and destroy the uh, earth um, around the biocrust. Another threat to biocrust is global warming. Um, what this does is create less stable soil. Um, which will slowly degrade the biocrust, limiting its impact on the environment. And another threat, um, which is especially um, more recent and more damaging to the biocrust, is solar farming. So um, when solar farms are made, they have to dig up large um, areas of land to make space for the solar panels. Um, so by doing that, they destroy all the biocrust in the area. Um, but once solar panels are in place, they create a perfect environment for the biocrust to thrive. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword in the fact that it will destroy them, but it's also a perfect environment once they're in place. Um, and then if we scroll down a little bit, you can see pictures of where our biocrust will be living next year. Um, you can kind of see how they started off as just plain whiteboards and how they turned into pieces of art. Um, right now, we currently have four on campus, but we hope to someday expand that. And this quote down here kind of describes how we feel about the um, about the uh, Biocrest Vertical Gardens. And I'd just like to thank uh, one of our members, Ari, real quick, for the wonderful work they did on the artwork. And I'll hand it back to Gian for current research on Biocrest. As Marco mentioned, we want to have Biocrest living in our vertical gardens in the upcoming school year. And we also want to do research on it. So to do this, we decided we must learn about what other people are doing with Biocrust. Here are a few things we found interesting when we were researching. So one of the things we learned about, which the Conservancy actually told us about, was how Biocrust helps stop the spread of valley fever, which we found very interesting, especially considering valley fever is very present in Arizona where we live. Another thing we learned is that people are taking healthy Biocrust from certain regions, fostering it in labs, and attempting to replant it in other regions where Biocrust is crucial. They hope that this will help help the biocrust there and that they will adapt and just make the environment thrive. Something that we found interesting while we were also researching was how people are taking samples from the Mojave and Sonoran deserts where we live and implanting them in the Colorado Plateau to help combat climate change. The hope is that because the Mojave and Sonoran desert biocrust is already adapted to harsh environments and high temperatures that by putting in the Colorado Plateau, they will adapt in the plants and environment, they will thrive and just become better. All right, and then some future ideas for research um, on campus. So 
The first one will be to expand our vertical gardens. Um, as I previously stated, we only have four on campus, but we have tons of trophy, trophy cases um, around all the buildings where we can implant more vertical gardens. So we hope to someday have like a network of gardens around campus where we can be growing bio crust. Um, a, another idea that we have is to make bio crust in a lab, if that makes sense. Uh, we have a great biotech program running on campus right now, and we hope to somehow be able to make BioCrust in a lab. Um, our next idea to, is to observe the differences in BioCrust depending on its environment. So um, we mean to take some BioCrust from the Sonoran Desert and compare it to BioCrust, say, in Joshua Tree Desert. Um, and we hope to see what the differences are in the BioCrust depending on its environment and what animals live in the area. And then finally, we hope to someday next year be, allow students to do their own projects with the BioCrust and let them have their own ideas of what they want to try out with it. And we hope to be able to expand the environmental club and get new members through this idea. Um, I'd like to thank you all for having us and I'll hand it back over to Mr. Millen for some closing remarks. Okay. As you can see, these students have quickly developed a, uh, a strong passion for this project and could talk about it for days. So I don't want to take up too much longer of your time so that you have time to ask them some questions about this project. But I just wanted to quickly show you um, really our fourth and final component of this, which was creating a graphic roadmap of this vision, which the students did live with all the partners that we worked with and had an opportunity to brainstorm their ideas while those ideas were represented as this graphic drawing that you see here uh, live in the classroom. So this is now hanging up across the hall from our vertical biocrust gardens and serves as a reminder, not only to these students, but to everybody else in the school about the path of the project and what we have in mind for the future and um, the purpose is to keep us on track and encourage engagement for future years to come. So before we open up, I think hopefully we have time for a couple questions for these students. I just wanted to give a couple last minute thank yous to everybody. We had a lot of help on this project, as you guys heard. So a quick thank you to the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, Northern Arizona University and Dr. Helen Rowe, um, Scottsdale Community College and the Center for Native and Urban Wildlife, the Scottsdale Leadership Group, Johanna Kaiser and SUSD, and of course, Joe Arteca and our SUSD facilities team, who did a ton of work behind the scenes to get us to where we are today. And at that, I think we hopefully have some time for some questions, um, which I will let the students field for you guys, if anybody has any. Thank you all. Thank you guys. I think uh, everyone on the call, I'm sure, is super impressed. Um, I Thank you to Claire and to uh, Dr. Rowe for, for all their help and uh, to Mr. Milne. Uh, you know, I have two kids and I just I uh, personally would like to say thank you uh, for inspiring interest in science and the uh, the students. You, you guys are, uh, it's encouraging to see your energy and, and curiosity. Uh, all I'm seeing is a bunch of compliments on how well you guys did. So I'm looking for questions, but it looks like a bunch of compliments on how well you guys did. <laughs> We're happy to hear that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. They've been very excited about this presentation, and I think it was apparent how, how passionate they are about this project. Most definitely. And uh, hey, uh, always uh, down the road, hope you guys have some interest if you're not too busy doing bigger and better things to see you out there um, helping out as stewards. <laughs> of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> They're all looking forward to more field trips to the Conservancy next year, for sure. Yes. It'll be a big part of the plan. Awesome, awesome. Um, I don't know if there's any questions out here. Um, Melanie, I, I might turn it back to you at this point, but I I'll got one in the uh, chat, Lars. What's that? I just put one in the chat. Okay. Uh, isn't the school work paired with areas in the preserve? Can you discuss that? Did you guys want to talk? So I will, I'll let the students talk about that a bit. We have unfortunately um, not had much time this year to start on that, but part of our vision for next year is to pair basically restoration plots on our campus with restoration plots at the preserve so that students can collect data on both of those and see um, how restoration efforts may be different in a sort of more urbanized environment here versus a more rural environment in the preserve. 
And yeah. maybe you guys can elaborate on what you hope to, to see with that. Sure. Yeah. So definitely one of the key interest points of when we initially began this project was that urban and rural difference, not necessarily rural, but urban and wild habitat difference and see how that impacts, say, for example, in the instance of the uh, of the pollinator garden and the saguaro pathway project, we wanted to see the differences of growth and development and also species presence uh, based both on our our very urban location of our high school uh, as compared to the relatively untouched landscape of the of the conservancy. So we hope that next year we can work very closely with the conservancy on this aspect of the project. Um, but that is definitely something that we jump started over here is starting those observations of how these uh, how these projects are coming along in our environment. And we hope that down the line, we're able to make some great comparisons to what we ob observe in the conservancy in the same controlled environment. Awesome, thank you. Um, and there's one more question. Uh, what has been the most fun and most challenging part of the process so far? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, I can definitely um, say one of the most fun um, parts of this entire process has been the hands-on labor intensive work that we did as a club. Um, this may seem rather ironic considering when one hears labor intensive work, well, that doesn't sound very fun, but um, <laughs> the aspect of working um, together on the, um, even the more challenging parts of this project is really what made us closer as a club and is really what brought our ideas to life, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So um, ironically, the labor intensive work is what um, would have been one of the most fun parts of this project. Yeah. It would also yeah. be one of the more challenging ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> it, it goes hand in hand. It was amazing to take these like challenges that were presented to us and just like be able to have fun with them. And I mean, in a club, like we're working with our friends. And I think especially removing the fountain grass was really fun because we 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 kind of just messed around and just like had fun while also you know, learning about like the invasive species. Yeah, as Claire stated earlier in the presentation, um, by doing the labor intensive work, this also made our club members a lot closer and just allowed us to have a lot more fun than we would have thought we would have had digging holes in the dirt. <laughs> I would definitely want to jump in and mention rather than not necessarily a challenge, but certainly something that was a great adaptation for us. Um, I briefly touched on it, but something that was new to us was this kind of experimental design and conduction of a very uh, controlled experiment, which is something that we have not personally, I, I can speak for all of us here, we have not personally conducted ourselves before. So um, starting from scratch, but also with the advice from other, uh, other stakeholders that assisted us in this project, that was really able to open our eyes to how to conduct this project and how to make sure that all of our experimental data was very controlled and very accurate. Uh, because we wouldn't have known fully how to make sure that everything was uh, in order without the advice of all these other groups that advised us in the correct direction. Come on, come on. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for inviting us. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, Melanie, I'll, I'll drop it back to you. All right. Thank you all. Wow, that was amazing. Um, Saguaro High School, just kudos. Um, so much hard work and so much enthusiasm. And I, I know that I'm going to leave this today full of hope. So amazing work. Um, the last part of this presentation is looking forward. So let me just uh, go ahead and queue up a really brief slideshow uh, for those of you who are gonna be able to stick around um, after, after, uh, after 4.30. So hold on just a second. Oh, can you all see the slides? Yes, no? Yes, awesome, yes. okay. So looking forward. Next year is gonna bring another season of science and discovery. Um, we've got some new things lined up. Uh, the city of Scottsdale has engaged um, a wonderful uh, organization to revise the ecological resource plan, which is our joint planning document that we developed with the city back in 2015. 
And this company is going to take that and and really, you know, with uh, with consultation from us and other stakeholder groups, um, really flesh it out into something that's um, that's that's very solid. Uh, we are going to be a part of that process, and we're greatly looking forward to it. Our biodiversity projects are going to continue. And our invasive species partnerships will continue. Um, we're looking at removing, and Paul, don't, don't panic when I say this, um, but I think a good estimate is about 300 to 500 acres of fountain grass and buffalo grass per year between the consultants that the conserve or that the uh, the city of Scottsdale hire and the conservancy stewards. So that I think is a very, very doable goal and something that we can really start putting a dent in those invasive species. Um, one more year of tortoise telemetry survey. I heard somebody say earlier that they hope that it continues for another year and we did secure that funding. Thank you, City of Scottsdale. And uh, we are going to do a full another year of the tortoise project and, uh, and collect that really excellent data. So we're very excited about that. And also um, the wildlife camera study is going to just go gangbusters next year because we can get um, an additional 30 cameras. Again, thank you, City of Scottsdale. And um, have all 60 camera, uh, cameras up at a time. Plus we're gonna be able to do the acoustic monitoring, uh, You know, pair that with the cameras so we can see how the noise environment is affecting the animal's behavior that we see. So that will be very exciting. Another year of sharing our work, we're hoping to present at the North American Society for Bat Research, Southwest Vegetation Management Association again, Sino uh, Desert Tortoise Council, and the 13th International Mammacological Conference. Um, we have some publications in the works and we hope to roll those out over the next one to two years or so. Um, that includes arthropods, butterflies, biocrust, and bats. And our public engagement will continue as we work with the Conservancy's Community Engagement Program to develop more, um, more lectures and presentations for the general public. Um, that we work, as we work with the Citizen Science Association, um, We'll work with the guided hike, bike and walk uh, program to continue developing these free public hikes that incorporate the research that we're doing um, and possibly an ecotourism uh, aspect to that as well. And we will continue the work um, through our education, uh, through living labs and all of the other uh, programs that we have with our education uh, team. Just another word on the living labs. Um, there's an awesome picture that I, I need to get to you guys um, of removing the fountain grass with Scottsdale leadership. Uh, we're gonna continue the work with Saguaro High School, continue the pollinator garden, Saguaro experiment in soil crust. We look forward to incorporating wildlife camera work into this, which is gonna be really fun. And we are looking forward to having the Saguaro High School and hopefully another high school out to um, install experiments on the restoration sites at the Fraze Field Trailhead where the students, uh, which is one of the sites where the students did their field trip. And more field trips. Uh, that's something we're planning and we're really looking forward to seeing how the students continue to innovate, um, you know, with these projects now that they've got their gardens ex and experiments established. Um, we just want to see what they do with it. Uh, and we're looking forward to beginning the work with a second school to install a pollinator garden and experiment. And um, again, they'll uh, help, ex uh, excuse me, help install the experiment on the preserve and establish their own monitoring. So um, upcoming projects that will be highlighted or that we're, we're considering highlighting in the next year, next year's symposium, um, bird monitoring, the IUCN or International Union for Conservation of Nature plant um, evaluation that Helen's been leading at, uh, at uh, U of A, or sorry, NAU, it's the end of the day. Um, more on arthropods and phenology. Uh, we look forward to hearing more on the living labs. Um, hopefully from two schools next year, Saguaro and the new school. 
Uh, we hope to also bring more uh, research results on the Intel project, which is where they're using drones to try to find, kind of seek and find our invasive species so we don't have to do it by foot anymore. And um, we will circle back to our amphibian project. So looking forward to those in the next year. One big thing that is on the horizon and pending funding, that means, you know, if we're able to get the funding for this, we really want to do this. And that is um, potential paid internships. Uh, this would be for students from under groups that are historically underrepresented in STEM fields. It would pay a living wage. So it would um, compete with what we're seeing from, you know, fast food restaurants and things like that. So the students don't have to choose between going to work for McDonald's and going to work in a field that they love. Um, we would begin with two and then build up to six over several years and then cycle through. That's the plan. Uh, it would start in late high school. So the senior year and then go into early college. We already have a partnership with the Scottsdale Community College to help support this. And um, this would allow the students to be integrated into a wide range of experience, both with um, you know, the living labs and with uh, the work at the conservancy, all of the research work that you've seen, also community engagement and other aspects of the conservancy as well, and, uh, and education. And um, it would include a very significant leadership component too, because Ultimately, if we are able to do this, we want to be raising the next generation of conservation leaders in the Valley. So we, we want to raise them right. With that, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who participated and made this symposium possible and everyone who made the work of the Conservancy and our partners possible. I'm going to read off a few, but this is not by any means everyone. It's just <laughs> what we can capture. Uh, the Conservancy Citizen Science team working both in front and behind the scenes all the time to make this possible. Um, our Science Advisory Committee and Research Partners, Scottsdale Community College and Center for Native and Urban Wildlife, Center uh, for Arizona Conservation, or sorry, <laughs> the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance, that Conservation International, U.S. Geological Survey, National Phenology Network, uh, Central oh, Arizona Butterfly Association, CAP Leader, uh, Scottsdale Unified School District, um, Northern Arizona University, Arizona State University, all of our research partner organizations, City of Scottsdale, um, Bob and Renee Parsons Foundation, and the Arizona Game and Fish Department his, uh, Heritage Grant, and last but very not least, the Saguaro High School Eco Club, newly formed this year and bringing you everything, um, all that inspiring uh, stuff that you, you saw we have recorded all of these and we'll be sending them out um, in pieces and we'll also have them available. So, um, so look for a follow-up email with a survey. Again, thank you everybody for everything that you've done. Wonderful work.